When that scene unfolded, the protagonist introduced himself as Diaz, exclaiming that the massive plane stretched as far as the eye could see, but its shape had nothing but grass. He remembered a time when his mother told him to become a man whose job would benefit those around him, which was her final request. His father asked him to become a man who would protect the weaker ones, and it was his father's last request to uphold the honor of their deceased parents. He followed their final requests with unwavering determination, cherishing their memories. He went on to explain how at the age of 15, a war broke out with a neighboring country. In order to honor his parents' last request and protect the people around him, he volunteered to fight in the raging war for 20 long years in flames of war. Then, at the age of 35, a favorable peace was negotiated with the neighboring country and a ceasefire was declared. Finally, the protagonist had a moment to catch his breath. Somehow he had made it through the land as a patriotic hero, perhaps due to his simple skills in war and the records that set him apart from others. His Majesty the King praised him for his actions that went beyond what he deserved, and began a speech to announce the naming of the protagonist, believed to be an illiterate person whose worth only existed in war. He had a hard time understanding it at first, but it was eventually explained to him. His role is as a feudal lord who protects his people and collects taxes to be handed over to his majesty the king or something similar. It seems that the right thing to do is to visit the form after it is given, so he is somewhat reluctant to collect whatever little he brought into the carriage and set off to his almost non-existent room to prepare for the journey beforehand. He left the capital and the government officials standing to watch it all the time as requested by the carriage. He thought that apparently he had reached his destination. They stopped at what seemed to be the center of the field, and the officials began to outline the boundaries of the field. All he could see in front of him was a stretch of grassy fields extending to a more grassy plain. So basically, his domain was a grassy plain. The official said it was a suitable domain for an orphan like him even though he could do whatever he wanted on that piece of land. He continued by asking if the plane was called Netros, and he used his name Dias. He then announced that from that day on, he was Dias Netros when he became a missing protagonist. But he was able to search for clean water sources or others. He had to deal with dirty, muddy water during the war, but he walked quite far and still didn't see a single tree. He wondered if the grass was useful and then convinced himself that maybe the grass was delicious, but on the contrary when he tasted it. It feels really terrifying when he decided to do that on a holiday. He will think about somehow and find a way to avoid a terrible death in the unknown. He shouted to himself that he would try for two more days, and if it seemed impossible, he could leave the plane and see if he could help someone somewhere, which was the best way to fulfill his parents' last request. When he fell asleep again, Someone appeared out of nowhere and brutally asked him to wake up. After that, the protagonist woke up and was confused whether the girl was a human like him. Suddenly, there were horns on her head while he was still wondering about her race. She screamed, asking who he was and what he was doing there. He answered that his name was Dias and he had just woken up. Then the girl asked why he was sleeping in a place like that, to which he replied politely that he was told to do so. The girl asked if he was being an idiot, to which he replied that he couldn't just deny it like that. If he had to be honest, she asked him about his purpose of being there. After that, he told her that if he really had to go down for it, his goal was to live and not die. The girl became frustrated after hearing his answer, and just as she was about to attack him, he stopped her and continued to ask him boldly, unless he wanted to be the target. Then he had to answer sincerely through which he tried to explain to her that he was genuinely determined. The protagonist announced that his goal was to live based on his parents' last request and to help and protect those around him who were weaker than him. He asked why she didn't like what he said, and she told him that she had no reason to lie like him. Angered, she asked him if he was a friend or an enemy. The protagonist was unsure why she asked, and wondered if it was really something she wanted to ask someone he had just met. He thought about asking her if she could answer, not a friend, not an enemy. She told him that he had to choose. After that, 
The protagonist wondered why the girl was so interested in his answer because she was his mother and because she stood in his way. So she was the subject. But then he realized that the girl was upset because he was not the feudal lord, taking a stand as a friend and a protector of the feudal subject like him. So he declared himself as a friend and protector for her. No matter who came before him as his enemy, he would stand and protect her to keep her safe. Suddenly, a blue light appeared from there. The protagonist saw what the girl got and was surprised. He explained to her that it must be a mistake because it was impossible. She asked him to hold her hand as she stated that she would take him to her village immediately. The protagonist became confused because he didn't know that there might be a village in that empty place. When the plane asked him to follow it secretly. When they both arrived at the village, he was surprised to see a village like that while walking all day, but couldn't find anything, let alone a well-built village like that. She announced that indeed he would meet the village chief when she took him to the hall. One of the people shouted that Aruna had brought a stranger among them. The leader asked if she had assessed the man as a blue one, and she shouted that she found him sleeping, so she interrogated him after securing him. But he appeared stubborn and continued to ask pointless questions. She also stated that she asked what was important and asked if he became a friend or an enemy afterwards, which the blue light that bound appeared. The chief asked him about the blue light that entered as an answer to such a question and asked him if it wasn't a red hue color at all, to which he answered that it was true, it was entirely blue in color. It seemed very interesting to the tribal chief when she asked him to share his name and he answered that it belonged to him, his name was Diaz. She stated that his name echoed in mystery, so she asked him if he wanted to declare himself as her friend as she did to Aruna. The protagonist shouted like that, now he knew the young woman's name was Aruna. He announced it to them because everyone in that form was a subject, of course. They would all be his friends. But suddenly he was attacked by them, stating that he didn't need to be like that. Impatient because, first of all, he needed to share how he could accept that order from the king. The protagonist wasn't sure what the meaning of starting was, but he told them his story from the beginning when he was still a child. After that, the tribal chief saw clearly the reason why he shone so brightly with that blue color. To his surprise, there would be humans outside who had horns like that. He added and announced that he acknowledged him as the feudal lord who would protect all his people with everything in his power. But he hoped to hear his opinion from that perspective, if indeed it wasn't his subject matter. Then what action would the protagonist take? Confused by that, the tribal chief explained and asked if he would still be their friend, even though they weren't his subjects. The protagonist replied to the chief that if there was no one else, they would share it with their neighbors and added that he wasn't just a neighbor to help when needed, but to make them friends at that time. But he was still confused by the chief's question not being his subject as it should be, maybe because it was his mother, and logically everyone, and it belonged to him as a subject. When the tribal chief saw him enter, she thought she said he was in the suspicion because it was not the subject, even it could be said that it was the enemy of his kings, because indeed they had long fought in the war with their country. But maybe they still do it to become friends, and not enemies, the chief added that for him. He was the rarest, intense blue color, and in order for him to live peacefully among them. She then asked him to raise his head and asked if he wanted to hear her story. And when she started telling her story, she began by saying that her name was Mo Ru, who was the leader of the Oni folk. She told him that they had long fought with their country all this time for dominance of the land. Small battles occurred. After the war, and the war itself, happened small battles that occurred for fifty years in the crushing defeat they suffered, losing many of their people. They were expelled from the land where the protagonist asked her if she was chased out of the land fifty years ago. Then how could she still be there? After that she answered yes. They were able to infuse magical power into their horns, and with the accumulation of magic, they could achieve many miraculous achievements that they did not have. Their horns could not be called magic like that. It was all a blur, a place where they could conceal both people and belongings. They utilized the power of their surroundings to retreat to the land and live their lives in secrecy, away from the king's prying eyes. 
The main character couldn't help but exclaim that it was truly an extraordinary tale. However, he pondered whether he should reveal all of this, considering he was under the king's authority. She shared the story with him simply because he was a man in a blue suit. Otherwise, he wouldn't have mentioned it. There exists a mystical human ability called soul judgment, where one's hostility is manifested as red within their soul, but only for a minute. The tribal chief once asked him if he believed it was normal for a boy to obey his parents' final request, even at an advanced age. He had lived a long life, yet he couldn't deny that he had never encountered such an idiot before. However, it seemed to be their destiny to foolishly become feudal rulers in the land, as there was no limit to the extent of their elusive magic's ability to conceal. The protagonist questioned why he insisted on remaining on the plane when they could travel far away and live in peace. It seems that she died from a long-standing illness. Then the chief declared that the protagonist had no shelter and regulations, and they would provide their assistance, even sharing livestock with him as little as possible. Instead, he asked him not to talk about the village to people in the capital, even the king he served. She also added that he could use the Aruna that she called, at least for a while. He would be there to take care of them. She exclaimed that there was much he needed to understand to live prosperously on the plains. For that, Aruna would stay with him and teach him the ways. He turned to Aruna and stated that because he brought that foreigner among them, he had to take responsibility until the end. This is how the protagonist took his first step towards becoming a feudal lord, living together for some reason with a girl named Aruna. Aruna exclaimed that she was a breed of livestock with two horns and entirely covered in soft eckle wool. The soft wool was indeed raised not for its meat, but for its wool. He added that it grows wool faster if it eats more grass as much as possible. Clip its wool and take it to the village for food and other barter. The regulations nodded in agreement. She got annoyed with his answer, so she asked what was wrong with that weak person's response and if he really understood what she had just said to him. He replied that he got it honestly. The continuation explains that Mia cares about farming and animal husbandry handled with wild animals like there are many that need to be memorized. The protagonist shouted to himself that Aruna might have come to the job reluctantly, but he did it carefully and delved into the details of his survival plan. The chief promised him that he would indeed send some media that she sent to answer the trust given by the people within him. He decided to enrich the people who fled under his care and to increase the population. When the protagonist remembered what the tribal chief told him, he asked her if she knew how she could increase the population. She replied, Yes, she will be like for the population in her own eyes. The people are not counted, so the count remains at zero. Aruna exclaimed that she continued to talk about this population subject, but there was nothing he had to do before worrying about his subject number. At that time, he got one year in the provision just for one person. He added that if all he got was more, all they could expect was whether they died of hunger or disease. He stated that now he mentioned it, he somewhat hoped that the Oni people would give him more help once they had more people. She warned him not even to dream about it. The protagonist mentioned that he knew it, and apologized because he forgot that he mentioned it, which meant that in this case, he thought he had to solve the housing and other provision problems. He referred to it as Lord Dumbo and handed over his back. He asked her about what was behind her, and she replied that it was made by Matabi, grinding grass that wild animals liked. If she spread it, they would run. She also told him that if he hunted the animals that came running there, he would not only get their meat, but also their skin and horns. He could bring them back to the village and barter them for provisions and more. He concluded that he could lay the groundwork for his new venture by getting involved in the main hunting pursuit, in which he claimed to be skilled because he didn't have to think too hard. Aruna advised him to keep her back to the wind and walk until he couldn't see the village anymore because being too close to the village would cause problems with the animals. He chose a spot, but was confused about how much he should use. She didn't explain too many details, stating that when in doubt, it's all about instinct. After that, 
He exclaimed to himself about it, and now he just had to wait for the animals to come and wonder how much he would need to exchange for the yurt. He needed as much as possible, not just one or ten, maybe a hundred. He exclaimed that it would take more than a day to get a hundred, but suddenly he was surprised to see a herd of animals rushing towards him. He didn't know where their plan came from. He relied on his fighting axe as his weapon of choice, not worrying about anything else. If they had shields, he would pierce through them. If they wore armor, he would attack the armor. No matter what they had, they all died when they started to flee. Although he suspected he had gotten about half of them, it was quite easy because their movements were predictable. Suddenly, as he turned towards a dead animal on the ground, he didn't know how he would move them all. He could carry them one by one, but he didn't think about how he would transport them back before he started swinging his axe like an idiot, because the girl had also left. Now they were calling him Dumbo again, as the protagonist. He never thought there would be someone in the world who could withstand his gaze. On the contrary, when Aruna saw him carrying a buffalo, she exclaimed that it was quite something, and he got a black buffalo on his first hunt. He admitted that it was quite masculine, confused if that was what they called a black buffalo. After that, he explained that he got about half of what came, but he couldn't carry everything. She asked how many of them they were talking about, and he told her that there were about thirty or forty of them. The chief and Aruna were impressed and exclaimed that it was truly extraordinary to see him from a different perspective. The chief said that he had done it very well and never wasted any opportunity to show off his masculinity. Aruna responded by saying that she had never seen a man with so much masculinity before and added that she would call someone else to help them bring their buffalo when they would take them. The chief said, indeed, it is as effective as hunting 30 black buffaloes at once, truly an extraordinary display of masculinity. The protagonist asked them what they actually meant by masculinity, as what he could see seemed a bit different from how the word is used elsewhere. The chief tried to explain that masculinity means the masculine presence, the values of a hardworking, reliable, and intelligent man. He added that all these qualities combined into one are what defines masculinity. The protagonist now understood it because he possessed that manly attitude. Aruna's demeanor changed for the better as he told her that, according to their calculations, Aruna was a woman worthy of their tribe, and of course he would greet her with a good display of masculinity. He hoped she was a few years younger than him and might also have it. The protagonist exclaimed to straighten up if he showed his masculinity. Then he deserved to be with those women. The chief wondered what other responses would be given according to the femininity criteria. The protagonist asked if there was nothing else to consider, like how handsome he was or how well he spoke. The chief tried to explain by saying how foolish what he was talking about was, and asked if he could fill his stomach with a handsome face or a sweet face. The conversation made him increase. He stated that if he had to marry a man who did not have masculinity, it would not be fair. He would starve, but so would his children. Everything other than masculinity was completely useless. The women of the tribe were the protagonists. Admitting with different cultures came different perspectives. Common sense and values, while she was still thinking about it, all masculinity was the main thing. She asked him if he wanted to marry Aruna, then he had to prepare the bride price. He seemed confused hearing the dowry he received, saying that Aruna was beautiful and also a skilled worker, so she hoped the price would be high enough. She added that was all she could afford that day. Maybe the amount was enough for Aruna's wedding. The protagonist was surprised and wondered if he could marry Aruna with that, even though he said he had to take the right steps first, according to customs demands to make it look like that. Speaking as if it were normal and the only view of marriage is good, but scary. But then he realized it was not the time to talk about such things. What he had to prioritize was how to increase the population. The chief explained that he didn't need to worry. Those without horns and the Oni people were fertile and able to have many children, she explained. When the protagonist woke up the next morning, he saw that Aruna had already prepared his delicious breakfast. He asked her when they would start the hunting day, to which she replied that she thought they had plenty from yesterday, but asked if there was anything else they needed. She told him that if they needed to gather people there, they would need a well, 
and a warehouse along with the tools to manage the water supply. He suggested they could hire craftsmen from the village, but for that, they needed more barter. After that, he agreed to hunt the black buffalo again, but Aruna stopped him by saying it wasn't a good idea to hunt the same animal since the village no longer needed it. Now she asked him if he had ever hunted monsters before, so what if they went monster hunting instead of animals? The protagonist exclaimed that they are in all a festering presence. They emerge unbidden from the maelstrom brewing in the festering miasma of the earth, or escape rampaging from Edelrich's dungeon of forgotten ruins. They seem to hate life itself and, throwing themselves into a frenzy, attack everything they see, leaving only death and destruction behind. Their flesh and blood are poison itself and unsuitable for consumption. But their skin and nails and horns plus the demon stone near their heart have various uses in everyday life. He asked Aruna if there were even monsters around the area they were in, to which she answered that there weren't many, but there were some if he just looked for them. She added that she could use magic to locate them, so if he brought her along, everything should be done very quickly. He refused her help by stating that the hunt was dangerous, because it wasn't a fun day at the park. So he asked her to tell him where to find it, but instead of telling him their location, she told him that if he went with her, it would just be like a fun day at the park. When he came out of his shed, they wished him a good morning. May Oz gave them to him by the matriarch, the man was named Francis, and the woman was named Francoise. Suddenly, he noticed some villagers and wondered if they were carrying the items that he had exchanged for the black buffalo. He worried about his beard because he would look messy. The girl announced that her preparations were complete. He looked at her and noticed that her makeup was different from usual, and he changed it because that was the reason. Even as a fool, it seemed like he could guess. He stepped forward and told her that he had asked those people to take care of Miaz so that they could both stay together all day. He told himself that they had to defeat the monster before something happened to him. When they reached the monster northern plains, they found that the area was famous for being a monster breeding ground over time. The protagonist exclaimed as they returned home after harvesting a useful part of one or two monsters that they should have enough money to build a well and a shed. Aruna told him to hand it over to her and her magic to find the monster, as she was not only skilled in housework, but also quite proficient in magic. The protagonist agreed. He utilized the magic spell and suddenly shouted like that. He found a monster but it seemed to be quite a big one. He added that it might be a mistake. There was no other monster around. Dia shouted that it might mean that this one was dangerous. If so, he asked Aruna to find a low hiding place temporarily, while he would do recon alone in front. He reminded her that she should follow him as she did with the camouflage magic. If the monster turned into something they couldn't handle, they could use the camouflage magic and retreat. After that, the protagonist allowed her to join him. When the protagonist saw the monster, he shouted that it was a turtle. Aruna corrected him by stating that it was an earth dragon, also wondering why such a monster was there at that time. He ignored his thoughts and decided to start hitting it around, asking Aruna to hide, but she ended up hiding. He asked her not to be foolish. The monster was an earth dragon, he added, and he couldn't defeat it. However, he told her that it was okay, and if the situation became uncertain, they could escape because he was a turtle and wouldn't chase them. He noticed that the monster didn't care at all, so if he aimed for its neck or legs, he was sure it would be a turtle. He wasn't sure if his axe would be effective against its shell, but he decided to try at least because he wouldn't know until he tried. When he attacked the monster, he noticed that it held back. Then he launched an attack on its neck, blocking the hole with scales he didn't know might be effective. Suddenly, Aruna screamed, asking him to run as it was impossible to defeat the Earth Dragon alone. He shouted that it might be true, but until when should he retreat? He wanted to try everything he could. He was sure that Aruna would call him Dumbo again, but it turned out there was nowhere else for him to attack. If the first attack didn't work, he would attack twice, and if that didn't work either, he would attack three times. That's how he fought. As long as his strength lasted, he could repeat it again and again. He realized that it might lead to a different direction, so he prepared his weapon and threw some spells. He was sure it might surprise people, but he was confident. 
When he first noticed it, he explained that he understood the war axe when he was still in the Corps Volunteer. It was his war trophy from a man he defeated, a rifle or something from a neighboring country. He fixed most of the minor damages himself, although it was an automatic process. But if he chanted the mind update, his mind would quickly fix itself for the second round. He was ready, but he noticed that he was in a stalemate and not making any progress against the shell. When night fell, they had no choice but to retreat. The protagonist was not happy with this thought, thinking that he couldn't handle a turtle that was too big. Suddenly, he saw Aruna trembling, so he wondered what was wrong with her. If she was cold, then he decided that he might have to stop. But as he did, he strengthened his resolve to do it. Aruna noticed this and broke through the monster's shell. Despite being attacked very badly, the earth dragon spun around again, emitting its magical poison and affecting him. Even though he was so far away from it, he was still surprised to see Dias unaffected by it. On the other hand, Dias was confused as to why the turtle did not attack him at all, not because he complained about it, but because he decided to keep hitting it until it cracked. He saw that it was the first time someone had actually managed to break through its protective shell compared to before. Its movements were stiff, and its aim was off, so it seemed confused. When it continued like that, that's when he got the turtle on its back. Suddenly, Aruna was then attacked by the monster and got hurt. After that, Dias realized the turtle was trying to hurt Aruna, not him. But because she was his friend, he decided to defend her. In a rage, he managed to defeat and cut the monster. Then he rushed to Aruna, who was crying like a baby, saying that she would marry him. By that time, the villagers had also gathered and they asked if they were both okay. The villagers were worried about them being late, so they all decided to look for them. When they saw that the earth dragon was defeated, they could not believe their eyes. They were now trying to console it. Its desperate grip felt tighter than the dragon's. As he asked it to calm down, he shouted to himself that he couldn't come free, no matter how hard he tried. When the villagers saw the earth dragon's body, they all started singing in joy. The protagonist had defeated the earth dragon and they began to call him their lord. As the protagonist began to move the earth dragon, he realized that the cursed giant turtle was proving to be quite a hassle to move, so he decided to seek help from all the villagers who had gathered there by the time they all returned to the village with the turtle. It was already morning when they all arrived at the village. The chief called him and admitted that he was surprised to hear that Dias had killed the earth dragon alone without being affected by the magical poison that used to weaken everyone else, but had no effect on him. He added that he would be able to keep most of the materials from the processing because their value was such that they had nothing to barter for it. In return for what they could offer, they could only extract a small part of the carcass processing to extract valuable materials, along with enough warehouse building materials, for another yurt. And of course, he mentioned the conditions, so that they could build another yurt to store the materials. He could send some materials from the Earth Dragon to them, as he believed they would be able to reach the peak of their interest from the traders who came there. He also stated that he would benefit from establishing a trade relationship with them for his form. Afterwards, there was a wedding gift exchange with Aruna. If you offered even just one nail from the Earth Dragon, his parents would be thrilled with what they received. It was all so confusing, so he decided to ask her about the wedding gift exchange he mentioned. She explained that a wedding was a necessary tradition, but he disagreed and brought up a hypothetical scenario where their neighbor was a dragon slayer with no ties to the village. This would lead to fear and conflict, he argued, highlighting the courage it took to slay a dragon. She pointed out that if he were to compete against Aruna, all the village girls would be vying for his affection. He pondered whether he could handle it alone, knowing that the kingdom's men could only marry one maiden, and they believed Aruna was the chosen one. He felt pressured to marry Aruna first, despite the village chief's assurance that there were no such customs in their village. Aruna's parents were ready to announce the marriage, leaving Dias to decide the timing. Compromise was necessary to resolve the situation, and so it was done. How the marriage between the protagonist and Aruna became official, there was nothing he disliked about her. On the contrary, she was quite beautiful in his eyes. 
He took care of her very well and was affectionate towards Diaz as well. When he considered everything, he realized that getting married wasn't a bad idea because Aruna was 35 years old, so that was the last thing. It's time for him to start thinking about marriage. No matter what, he asked the villagers about Aruna's age, and she answered that she was 15 years old. In this winter season, how lucky he was to have just caught a good catch when he reached marriageable age. Dias knew he would still be young, but this was more like a father-daughter relationship first and foremost. Based on the kingdom's law, the minimum age for marriage is 18 years old. It couldn't happen until he turned 18. The engagement must last for the next three years, and maybe by then he would be used to the idea. So he took all that time to make himself an extraordinary feudal lord. But then he realized that just getting used to the idea wasn't enough, because it would be a disrespect to the commitment he made. So he really had to devote himself to the idea of becoming a ruler in that form. And as a man, he decided to show his dedication. A month has passed since Aruna and he got engaged, the well was finished, and the warehouse was built. It can be said that they are now enjoying the expected comfort. His mind was full of ways he could increase the number of subjects in the FUM, but he couldn't find anything that could work. The total number of subjects in the FUM was zero, but he thought he could count Aruna as a subject in the FUM, even though she was more like a family than a subject. Suddenly, when he was thinking about improving his students' grades, Aruna came and announced that they were now going to have a baby. Hearing this, the protagonist was overjoyed as he entered his house. Dias was happy to see Francoise actually pregnant. She thought Francis was starting to get jealous because his wife was the only one getting attention while pregnant. Aruna had told Dias that Miaz was calm, intelligent, and able to understand human speech using that intelligence and wisdom that came with it. Able to survive in that harsh world, even though the wild Mao could understand human speech in a week or more. Quite surprising. It explained how smart Mia's was, taming her. It was a voluntary decision by the Mia's, because they could rely on her strength for protection, care, and feeding. Aruna tamed, came and told Dias that Mia's pregnancy was not good news at all. As smart as were, they were far more vulnerable to fear especially when pregnant. She added that sometimes they died from being too scared. They found comfort in the presence of the strongest members of the pack. In this case, it was herself, so they had to stick with her as much as possible, setting aside fear, especially at night when they slept. She answered that she understood, asking if she should just sleep there. But she told her that it wasn't right like that. They could bring her inside. Many men didn't like that and it became a source of much dissatisfaction. To be fair, it can be messy and smelly too, and some find it hard to relax with Mia's staring at them all the time. The protagonist assures her that if that's the case, then he needs her. Don't worry about her because she's not bothered by it at all. Francis and Francoise are their precious family, and for their little ones, there's nothing Aruna said that she's very happy to think about it. And the protagonist is kind-hearted and also masculine. Suddenly, their theme starts screaming. The protagonist thinks all the screams are the same, but Aruna tells her that there's a subtle difference that indicates various meanings. It seems like Aruna understands it even though she can't understand their voices herself. She asks both Mia's what they're saying, which seems like they're both asking her and Dias to leave their love life for themselves and not interfere. She asks what's wrong with spending time together building affection as a couple. Suddenly, Aruna's horn emits some colors. The protagonist exclaims that she has seen the green radiance for the first time, which she explains to her is something that triggers a magical ward. She adds that it's pointing towards the east, getting closer like that. But she doesn't know who they are. They look like humans on horses, about ten of them, she tells the protagonist. Then she understands that the green radiance is a response to the ward, and realizes that the kingdom is also in the east so she decides to go and check it out as she can't think of anyone who would visit her like that unless they're bandits. She suspects it would cause some trouble, so she asks Aruna to blur everyone with her magic. She is becoming more and more afraid, assuring them that he will return because there are ten of them who cannot be tougher than that dragon.
Aruna asked him not to worry about the house when he stated that he relied on him before he could say anything else. His axe was found. They three of them were mounted. Four were on foot, remembering what Aruna had told him about ten people, but he guessed that included the horses they owned were riding now. The question was, are they friends or foes? But it seemed so unlikely that they would be friends if they had bows. They would have been stuck. So he decided to end it with one blow. But even before he could act, the man called his name. The man mentioned to him that it had been a long time since he had not done it, seeing him as the protagonist, remembering him because he was almost a comrade from the past, respected him regardless of his status as a poor orphan, and became his trusted friend, reliable in life and death. The protagonist stated that it was indeed very nice to see him and asked what he was doing there, and he answered that he was a guide and guardian appointed to the gentle people there who seemed to have something to ask of him. And at that moment, a woman appeared with girls, making the protagonist wonder who they could be. Klaus asking the protagonist to take them to their land like the others. Tired from the journey, the protagonist asked in which class they were discussing, and whether what they meant was where they lived. They agreed to show it to them and were excited to think that they would see where they lived because they couldn't wait to see what kind of luxurious excavation it might be that was obscured by the protagonist's training. But they didn't expect the magic of obscuring to work so well. They happily went back to their tired friends and asked them to feel free and invited them to the girl who accompanied them, stating that it was a great honor to come before her presence. By saying that, she introduced herself as the third princess, and she called Diani. But she asked if the tent-like condition currently built elsewhere was believed to be true. However, she admitted that there were no signs of the craftsman, which offended one of her guards when the protagonist called her name wrong and called her rude. She asked him to call her Royal Highness because he should know her place. The princess stated that it didn't matter to which the protagonist revealed that she didn't have a craftsman and she didn't have anything that was so worthy of being called real. She added that what she had was what she saw, maybe not as much to be seen, but she built it with her own fingers, her own books. The princess was surprised and asked if she really built the place alone and asked where her carpenter was. The carpenter stated that there certainly was no carpenter on an empty plane like that. The prince asked if he couldn't hire some of the neighboring villages, as it was known that he had been given funds to facilitate the development of thieves, as well as generous grants befitting his hero status by his family. The protagonist revealed that he heard it for the first time because he didn't remember receiving even a single copper coin, let alone being financially supported to establish or develop anything there. He added that he initially thought he would die like a dog on the side of the road, but there was a way out. Hearing this, the guards were offended again, so the protagonist got straight to the point and asked why he went all the way out there. The princess announced that war had arrived for the hero once again, and it was the moment for a new war to be built in the kingdom. So she came to seek the help of patriotic heroes and begged him to lend her his ice force and power. She was willing to pay him or one of the girls behind her named Priya and Maruda to be his marriage companions. For this, he exclaimed to himself that he was definitely joking about the war because he couldn't just leave his pet behind. What was he talking about marrying a man he had just met? So he stated to her that he planned to no longer participate in the war and added that he couldn't send her any troops because he could see that the thieves were not in a condition to send even a single soldier. The princess was surprised, so she asked him if he could reconsider. She could also provide additional compensation, to which he told her that he couldn't help her, no matter what the reward was, if that was all she came there for. He asked her to go back to where they came from. Suddenly her guard interrupted and said that His Highness the Princess was designed to ask for her help, but she insulted her. It was an unreasonable rejection with that boring behavior. The guard continued to say that he was a farmer born as trash, and he must have lost his ability to know his superiors suddenly. The warrior's climb drew his sword, seeing what the protagonist also obtained, preparing for a fight, and successfully cutting his sword into pieces because he didn't feel any bloodlust in him. He posed to threaten or extort the protagonist excessively, 
so he declared that it was the end of their conversation and asked them to leave. When his soldiers were about to say something, he stopped them by saying that they had to leave, as if he made him more annoyed than that. We would get into big trouble. They were not a match together, knowing that they didn't want to fight. After they left, the protagonist realized that he accidentally fell into the sea and tore a wound on the floor where Aruna was. It would be very deadly for him. On the other hand, the princess was disappointed. She saw that she had nothing in her possession, no treasure and no army like that. It wasn't what she was ordered to have. She decided to take revenge on Dias for his treatment. Aruna shouted at Dias, all the women emitting red colors, one of them being a bright blue soldier, but the rest, whether they were red or white. He asked her if she was surprised when she found out that the girl was very, and of course Francoise started crying because he wanted to be by her side when they entered with unclear magic and observed what happened going towards the protagonist's pet and apologized to her that he couldn't stay with her after that. He turned to Aruna and asked her if the women emitting red color meant they were hostile and asked if it meant they posed a danger to her, assuring her that it wasn't like that. Soul Judgment told him that they posed a danger to both of them because they had already become a family. After their engagement, he asked who he thought could fix the floor, which clearly had to be done by the protagonist, fixing it. In the next morning, he hoped Francis and his wife had a good morning. After that, Aruna and he settled for breakfast. Suddenly, his horn shone brightly. Seeing him so confused, he told him that it was just an intruder about one. He had more details where a human came from the east. He confirmed it by saying that they seemed lost wandering there. The protagonist was confused about that one person because he didn't think they had a traveler when he was about to go see who the person he saw was. Aruna also came behind him and asked her if she also thought about joining him. He assured her that there was only one intruder, so there was nothing to worry about. They wouldn't blur their presence like that. It was fine, and he didn't want to watch Francois cry even though he said no. They joined when they all went to see who was in the RER. The protagonist recognized that person as Klaus, so he asked what he was doing there because he thought Klaus had also returned to the kingdom with those women. But Klaus stated that he was trying to find his way back to the protagonist, but got lost while looking for the path to where the protagonist admitted that there was no landmark except for the grass there. It was clear that Klaus couldn't find a way to die as the protagonist asked Klaus about his armor to which he replied that he was expelled from the kingdom, so he was asked to return the armor and sword. That's why he was in front of the protagonist, wondering if it was his fault that the person who kicked the woman and kept her away from him. Klaus assured him that it was what he wanted when he heard that there was a war happening in the kingdom again. If there was a war, it would happen again for him. The prospect of what he was doing didn't feel very pleasant, so he took the opportunity to quit since he also had something else he liked doing more than anything. Dias asked him about what he really wanted to do, which Klaus answered that he wanted to work with him again and asked if he could please hire him as his warrior. They fought together in battle, fully trusting each other. There was no one the protagonist could rely on as much as Klaus, and it was delightful to see him become his ally once again. But he looked towards Aruna, who told him not to worry. She radiated a blue light all the time when talking to him. He asked if she really thought about consulting with him, for which he thanked her. Klaus asked D who he was, the people who brought the sheep with him. The protagonist told him that it was a long story, so this is how it turned out. He got an ally named Klaus, and the number of subjects increased by one when the scene was revealed. We see Klaus begging to wait for what it is, leaving the village. The protagonist scolded him saying that it was enough because it was only temporary, and went back to the main forces to ask for reinforcement, adding that they didn't escape anywhere. Klaus defended himself by claiming that there were women and children in the shelter, and if they left, who would hold back the enemy forces? Dias answered that then maybe heaven would protect them. A few hours earlier, the protagonist exclaimed that it was all over, adding that the new house he just built was Klaus's new home. Klaus himself said that he was fine staying inside the yurt he trained in, but the protagonist actually made a hole in it when he was learning how to build them and felt bad about it. So he held back the new one for him. Suddenly, 
Aruna realized to tell them that it was time to eat. The protagonist drooled at the sight of the roasted black ghee potion, so he thanked her for cooking it. He turned to Klaus and said that he was joining in the real treat. When Klaus took a bite, he exclaimed that it was delicious royal cuisine. He continued by saying that Aruna would make a good wife and asked Klaus again about the equipment for K. Klaus. Since they have dragon materials in the warehouse, he wonders if they can use them to craft their equipment. He answered that, of course, the village has already forged some of those precious materials that they must make the most of. The fangs and claws are used for swords and spears, while the tendons can be used for bowstrings. He also heard that the shells can be used to make a great shield, as declared by Dias that it's great when everything is in order and ready because he wants to exchange those materials for it. When Klaus heard his lord say that the equipment was made from a dragon, he was surprised and shocked because he couldn't believe it. Dias was the one who killed the dragon, as explained by the protagonist to him that it was a earth dragon. When it shattered, its shell opened and killed him, but at a glance it looked like a tortoise shell because it couldn't fly. He's sure he marked that part for him. The knights can only face such monsters with full strength and an array of weapons. But Dias did it with no power at all. Alone. Klaus asked if Dias would definitely use those precious materials within him which he answered that he also wants to become the main force in their domain as the captain. He won't spare any costs. Klaus claimed that he understood, and thus he would restore Dias's trust and kindness because he will give everything. He has into that battle passionately. Dias and Aruna agreed that no matter who the enemy was, they will defend Francis, Francoise, and all their people. In the end, Klaus yelled out that they had just successfully secured the crystal clear position. Ten days later, Klaus claimed that his armor and spear were made from dragons and were so valuable that he didn't know if even a nobleman or even a king could obtain such equipment. But so far, it was believed by Lord Dias and Klaus, and now he had to fulfill his hopes for the capital city in the midst of a turbulent succession crisis, when the nobles had split into factions and all conspired against each other. The conflict spread even to the far border regions, Immoral lords freely did whatever they wanted from the capital city without paying attention to it more clearly than in the domain he passed through the journey there. Sheer cruelty codex. Because Lord Dias did not receive money gifts for his efforts. Perhaps because it was stolen by the second prince of the kingdom, famous for his greed. The third noble, Princess Diane, had no military presence of her siblings and undoubtedly wanted to force Lord Dias to join her. The effects of the succession battle among the royal family would even have a ripple effect to remote places like that. No different from a stormy sea. And that's why he came play was a warrior, and if another war broke out, it might cost his life, but he would not regret dying for it. Lord Dias, and perhaps his death, would happen to be very happy to see Dias worried. He asked him if there was something wrong, which he revealed that Aruna felt something coming. Twelve people from the east, one of them very weak and possibly on the brink of death, said that he would check on him before it was too late to ask if Closey was he would go with him. The protagonist asked Klaus to stay alert if something strange was about to happen. He sent Aruna and Berwang back as he needed to protect them. Klaus agreed, saying he understood and would be ready. Then, Klaus realized it was Lady Aruna's invisibility magic, which was amazing. As they suddenly disappeared into the air, he asked if it was true. It turned out they returned faster than expected. They were all elderly refugee women from their village, impoverished and lacking food to go around. The women were driven out because the duke's second son incited a rebellion as he grew in combat power to overthrow his older brother and foolish father's rule. Their territory bordered with their own, and the conflict continued. The leader of the group was called Grandma Maya, seeking ways to survive with her prophecy. They kept walking until they suddenly announced that they had twelve new subjects. He alone knew that he would tell the creature that they were refugees, free to reject it. They might also become very productive at an old age. However, the protagonist replied that it was amazing because they were all over 70 years old, and Grandma Maya was 90. They arrived like that. Eventually, he wondered if they could teach them the secrets of longevity. Klaus asked if he realized that the women could easily perish at any time the whole reason they were driven out. 
but Diaz didn't even listen. A couple of years back, a village close to their main base got attacked out of nowhere. The attacker questioned how they could even call themselves royal knights. If the village were to fall, it would be a major blow to their military strategy. They were sent there in the first place with the intention of retreating if necessary. But now it seemed like there was no way out. Klaus, feeling uncertain if he would make it out alive, returned to the protagonist. He was surprised to see that amidst the chaos, he wasn't alone. Klaus asked where the protagonist had been, and he explained that he had heard a child crying. Curiosity led him to investigate, and he found the little one. The protagonist then asked the village residents to protect the child on his behalf. However, the child clung to him, begging not to be left alone out of fear. Dias, making a promise to the child, assured him that he would protect him no matter what, as long as he stayed brave and endured. Shortly after that, Closet confessed that he couldn't recall much from that point onward. A moment later, Lord Dias and he swung their weapons with all their might to fend off the enemy from the village shelter. They were uncertain of the enemy's numbers, so Klaus's sole focus was to support his fellow fighters. He knew the best strategy at that moment was to make it as easy as possible for Lord Dias to drive the enemies away before reinforcements arrived. By dawn, there was some damage but the enemy forces had retreated. Lord Dias remained the same humble and honest person, despite being the lord of his own domain. Klaus also mentioned that he was foolish to even consider a noble death. Klaus called out that he needed to live like that so he could better support Lord Dias, as he gave everything he wanted to a worthy and honorable lord. And so he had to play his part to help when Klaus pushed Yurt, while offering the protagonist's help to stop him, saying that he shouldn't force him like that or it would end up breaking Yurt. Several days had passed since they received the old woman Aruna checked their souls and saw everything in blue, so they had nothing to fear as more people joined them discussing what to do. Mentioning the name of their village, Aruna asked about ILU because it was a traditional name that meant village. The first thought like that, the Dragon Slayer Town, was a good name for it, which Aruna disagreed with. The first village in the protagonist's area was established, and everyone wanted to celebrate it. They held a simple party, though quiet for a party. When she saw everyone's faces smiling at the party, she couldn't help but smile. She also called out that she had to do her best to ensure those people had more chances to smile. Suddenly, Aruna asked if she could take a moment to express that she wanted to talk to her about the population increase. She added that she regretted it. But to dampen her enthusiasm, she thought they had to address those concerns by reminding her of their previous conversation. One day, they would all have to talk about it. Planning to attract settlers, but it would come with something that would work quickly. It was difficult among them. The protagonist's plan soon materialized, rejecting Grandma Maya's plan, perhaps the simplest and fastest. But something like that was just temporary slavery he would still finish his own. The chairman came and asked if Dias had called him. He explained that he felt she called him there. The protagonist exclaimed that she was pretty sure she didn't say anything. In the way she stated she wanted to continue their conversation from yesterday, asking for his opinion on slavery because by selling dragon materials, she could buy many slaves and quickly increase the number of her students. He asked her why she did not follow his grandmother's proposal which involved selling humans in conversation as if it were such a commodity. The protagonist asked why there were so many slaves being sold that slaves were so cheap that they could easily buy the value of the village. But they still remained slaves, and it was truly dreadful. The protagonist herself had an issue with slavery after seeing countless slave soldiers on the battlefield, which was incredibly horrific. Seeing Aruna, she advised that in this case she could just treat her slaves well. The protagonist exclaimed buying them was the problem. If slaves were sold well, slave traders would restock their supplies. If they knew she would buy them, they would just enslave more people. He couldn't believe slavery ever happened honest slaves. So he decided that both owning and selling slaves should be prohibited. His grandmother was relieved because she didn't like slavery. While trying to increase the population, Someone might suggest buying slaves like that. 
He planned to oppose it, preventing it from happening. The protagonist said it won't happen until it does. Since he worries about it, she could tell him about it if he agreed that she could definitely do it. Because he heard many tales of disaster about slavery and Cardex, his feelings overwhelmed him, and he apologized. That's why he exclaimed that she was wrong to worry about it because it won't happen. Suddenly, Klaus appeared in that scene, but apologized when he saw it. As he looked at Grandma, he thought of something else. He felt embarrassed by his thoughts when Aruna mentioned to Dias what he heard from the servant, that a seller was coming towards them. They were very excited, waiting for some traveling merchants not only to trade goods, but also to spread news about to make inquiries about what kind of people they were. It seemed like something Grandma also did, agreeing with her. When the trader arrived, they all looked surprised to see the frog who shouted to the protagonist that he might be the dragon slayer he had heard about. He introduced himself as pagan and hoped for a mutually beneficial exchange. Aruna told them that his race was known as frog people. To be sure, the frog asked Dias to show him the materials he had harvested from the earth dragon. He defeated Aruna, noticing that his aura was white, indicating that he had no hostility as his goal was to trade alone, and he had no ill intentions. Furthermore, he wondered how much they should trade. The protagonist showed all the materials and saw the frog was surprised, asking if there was a problem. He exclaimed that he heard Dias defeated everything alone, so he thought the dragon might be small, but on the contrary, it was very different. If he asked as if he really took it down alone, the protagonist thought so. It seemed like he was really asking as a frog, saying it like the protagonist had found a dead dragon and lied. Suddenly, he asked for clues to bring him a turtle shell so he could split it. Hearing the frog was surprised, his mouth wide open at the materials harvested from the dragon. Shell is the hardest thing to separate, so in an effort to find a way to help the Oni people with their work, he just attacked the shell with his axe. And in just a few days, he found a way to split the shell with one blow. He shouted that they should call it the Dragon Breaker Axe. Klaus, bad at coming up with names, asked the merchant if he believed in him now, and he shouted that of course he did, and asked him to allow the purchase of the separation ID for the shell. The merchant asked him to unpack the card because he wouldn't be able to pay for it with the coins they had. After he did that, he shouted to the merchant that it seemed like he would be able to buy it one way or another because he was an honest merchant, so he would do it according to the market price of the item. It never fades away. And while they were there, he asked him how much to bring his other merchandise since he couldn't sell it in Beastkin land. But Dias was a human who might want to buy those items when he saw them. Those things reminded him of two girls with lifeless eyes, orphans like him. He wondered if he couldn't sell them to Treyer. The children were merchandise, and he also thought about whether the merchant sold orphaned children. Suddenly, the merchant shouted that the girls were slaves. Aruna asked him to calm down because the young girls would be scared of his anger so he turned to the frog and told him that they didn't want to buy slaves. Treyer tried to explain that they all misunderstood. The girls were not slaves. If the trader hadn't taken them as merchandise, the children would have died like that. Two children were born as twins in their village, where people cursed twins as they were believed to be children of the beastkin and were to be executed the next day after their birth. However, their parents did not accept it, so they took their children and ran out of the village where they lived, hiding so they would never be seen by the traitor who knew them all that time, but stayed in the forest alone, full of danger. Their terrible situation made both of their parents fall sick, seeing the rapid progress of their illness and hoping to die. They begged the merchant to take their children, but he was a traveling traitor, so he refused. Not running a charity where parents asked him to take over his merchandise children while they begged on the brink of death, offering whatever little money they had so he couldn't refuse, and he promised them to look after them, chasing the children until he could sell them to someone good. Not many buyers were interested in the cursed children, so the money they gave him ran out for their food and care was a losing battle. After encountering the frog, Aruna assured the protagonist that he was telling the truth about the strong blue children. The protagonist agreed to take care of the children 
and offered to exchange parts of the dragon to cover the costs. At first, the frog was overjoyed, but the protagonist initially hesitated to buy them. However, he eventually decided to take them in, realizing that the children had nowhere else to go. And that's how Dias ended up with the twins as part of his family, with the frog cheering him on. One day, when they were completely sold out, his group asked if a certain person could enter. The animals followed the frog's lead and said there was no problem at all. Dias was a simple man content with his modest life, never suspecting that trouble would come with those children. He dreamed of expanding his estate towards the mountains in the north, where he believed there was abundant mineral wealth. Whether it was the wild animal king or the mountains themselves, Dias planned to share the profits with his trading partner. And, as his trusted friend, he would surely receive a fair share of the benefits. They made a request for the next trade and could also send recruitment notices for thieves. They completed their first trade with the Pajin without any problems, except one thing. The protagonist asked the two girls how old they were, too thin, suggesting they were definitely three or four years old, adding that he would make sure they ate properly from then on, especially since then. Aruna is cooking with pleasure, asking them if they are looking forward to it and asking for their names afterwards. Klaus asked if they have a favorite game, suggesting they all play together or try any favorite food they could get. The protagonist responded by asking about their favorite songs or stories if their parents loved them enough to leave their home for them. Surely, the children love their parents too, which means they should appreciate the names given by their parents. But it seems they don't like the names decided by the protagonist to mention. They used their experience in naming children since they were girls. I think a funny name would be good for it. They exclaimed that they didn't want those names. The protagonist asked them to tell their names. They replied Senai and Ahan. After that, the protagonist thanked them, revealing their names. He exclaimed to himself that he didn't know how many times he had seen the children lock themselves in a shell, unable to recover. The result for those children almost always became the tragic focus of their parents' memories. He thought it would be a good way to destroy the shell, he told both girls that he and Kloos had to deal with the stuff. And as they did it, Aruna and Grandma Maja would help them do some new clothes that he also wanted to spend the food. Aruna asked for them to come while the grandmother promised to give them two steamed potatoes on the other side. Klaus was surprised to see Dias also good with the children. Before the war, he had acted as some kind of foster parent. For some orphaned children claimed the protagonist that he had taken care of newborn babies before, and also Klaus at that time, understood how he named the two girls very well. Protagonist revealed that there were ten babies he saw after previously. When he went to war, he left them with a man who had taken care of them. He hoped they would do well. Klaus replied, Maybe one day the children would hear news about him and come to see the protagonist after that. The protagonist checked the stuff and finally brought them to their warehouse. They were all sorted out and the job was done. When they saw the two girls, Dias exclaimed that they looked so clean and pretty. However, Aruna stopped him from touching the girl who asked him to wash her hands and dirty body first. Instead, he agreed and told her that he would do it afterwards. Then. Both he and Klaus went to shower with Lita on the other side. Aruna shouted that he would braid the girls' hair until they grew longer and could do it themselves. Grandma shouted that indeed they were not humans, but she felt their arrival was a good sign. She had to take care of them now, but she admitted that they looked very cute. When they returned, she exclaimed that the girls looked fine. They joyfully exclaimed that it was beautiful and sparkling. It seemed like they finally opened up until suddenly Aruna called them girls and told Sinai that in the past, their names meant beautiful like the moon, and for Ihan, her name meant holy moon. Aruna didn't know what was on their parents' minds when they named them, but she was sure they had a deep connection with the moon. She gave them gemstones called Ai, which were said to contain the power of the moon, asking them to keep themselves safe. The girls were excited and hugged Lord Dias and Aruna, saying that they loved them very much and wanted them to be happy. Suddenly, their pets also approached them, with Dias exclaiming that it seemed like they wanted to join in just as they said. 
The protagonist asked Tuna if she mentioned the old language when she chose the name for their village because she only thought about it when people spoke the old language. But could it be that her parents had something to do with the Oni people, to which she answered that she didn't know? She added that the old language only existed in legends, and she couldn't say whether there were outsiders who knew the language or not, and they were not human. Maybe in the past, they were mixed with the Oni tribe. It feels like it's been ten days already, and both Art and Ahan are still mourning the loss of their parents. However, they managed to take the first step towards healing. During those days, their smiles brightened up the entire village, and their joyful voices resonated with everyone. The villagers started to see them as their own children. Suddenly, Aruna informed them that someone was coming from the east, most likely a man on a horse riding at a fast pace. This person seemed to be heading towards the village, which became the main destination for the protagonist. In a teasing manner, he suggested that they should greet the newcomer once again. He asked his pet for confirmation, and Aruna joined in, revealing that it had mentioned they would stay there this time, as they didn't want to be far from Dias. Now that Sinai and are there, they want to stay by their side. As the two girls approached them, they asked Sinai and Ihan to come back soon, promising to wait for their return. After that, they both decided to investigate the identity of the intruder. Aruna was surprised to see that the person had a peaceful aura and didn't seem hostile. As they approached, a man came forward and apologized for coming unannounced. When Dias asked who he was, the man introduced himself as Camelot, a representative of Duke Kazdex. He explained that Lord Eldon wanted to meet Dias and had already made arrangements to do so. If Dias agreed, Camelot would accompany him to his house. The protagonists agreed to meet him there, and Camelot left, promising to deliver the Lord's message. The protagonist realized that Eldon must be a womanizing slave who started the Civil War a few days ago, and that he couldn't let someone like that get away with it anywhere near La Village. On the other hand, Aruna shouted that the man with a belly like a dark blue barrel was mixed in with the people around him, but he also heard that the protagonist was surprised because he couldn't believe that the man was blue. He said that he was a stronger blue person than he had ever seen until he met the protagonist. By that time, the king was already near them, apologizing but telling him that he really wanted to see Dias. He introduced himself as Eldon Kazdex and added that he had heard stories about the legendary hero from the realm of Dias since he was a child, as he also admired Dias back then. So he wanted to meet him and get to know Dias, even though he added that he wouldn't do anything for it. The protagonist asked him not to go crazy and not to do anything wrong. Aruna shouted that she wasn't angry at all and that he should be the one apologizing, as he was very rude to her husband. The king said that formalities were not necessary as they had just met Dias. He asked about the girl who was with the protagonist. He added that she was very good at hiding, but she had good ears and a good nose, so she noticed her there because she had the same scent as Dias himself. Dias was surprised that Eldon was able to penetrate his illusion. Eldon suddenly asked her what her race was and how she was related to the girl. She replied that she was Dias's wife. She asked Aruna if she was an Ain, but Aruna refused, saying she was one of the people born with horns, something she had never heard of before. She didn't know how to respond to the information Eldon gave her, which her aunt meant was a race similar to humans, but different. In this case, she asked if he was calling her aunt. Suddenly, she started crying because she was sad to see it. The protagonist had a child with Aruna, but she told him she wanted to have ten children, even though the girls she meant were orphans they adopted. The protagonist asked her why she was crying because they didn't have children, so he asked her to calm down. Eldon shouted that Dias and his wife had Ajin children, and Eldon is an Ajin. At that time, the protagonist was still young and eager to be raised. Everyone's desire to fight and recruit more volunteer soldiers in the kingdom. The story of his heroism turned into an asset. Of course, it was a theater drama. The first time he heard about Dias, the hero who fulfilled his parents' last request to overthrow the strong and protect the weak. He asked the tyrannical nobles to change their ways with his first act. Stories like that were found to be problematic by the nobles so the public show ran for a week before being stopped. Instead, 
it sparked concerns. People had the protagonist's heroic story as the subject of the show. It spread from person to person, even reaching remote areas, using the vibrations she got from listening. For them, most of the stories were made up. Not once did he see a nobleman on the battlefield. Eldon, of course. He didn't intend to take the story at face value, but people liked it. The veteran merchant who traded on the battlefield returned, guiding everyone he talked to who met Diaz on the battlefield. Nothing could be said about it, but words of praise, so he ended up admiring him. Eldon lifted him up onto the baggage, so of course his physical condition would deteriorate, and he collapsed so that it would be possible. Everyone worked together to achieve that far. The protagonist asked if he was truly able to move his body half an ajin since birth, between human and ajin. They are special creatures blessed with the rare ability to shape shift into their own ajin. His father was a former feudal lord named Enkas, and his mother was a slave of the elephant race named Neha. When his shape shifting took place, it also took a heavy toll on time. Previously, he seemed to have shifted from happiness to half ajin. It was one of Eldon's powers, but becoming half human could also cause various discomforts to occur. As Eldon had a small stature like a racing elephant member, but as a human, he had physical strength that caused his unstable physical condition, which could only be supported by vital care. He was accepted by his wives and also his male. They told the protagonist that there was Camelot to help him become normal. He was cared for in Kasich Fiam beyond description as Eldan's consciousness described his situation, painting his heart. If there were no barriers between races, then everyone would live in harmony. He wanted to build a society like that. That was the great desire he held onto the feudal lord's son, then began using his social status to protect Ajin from behind the scenes. There's a rumor going around that the protagonist heard that Eldan is a womanizer, it's also likely a cover-up to hide the truth because there's one more thing left, Aruna wanted to ask, and she did by questioning why Encast didn't enslave Eldon like all the other aunts, even though she belonged to him. Aruna insisted that Eldon should be treated like a slave, just like Neha, but Encast's wife was a woman named Jania, and they already had an eldest son named Jabu. Encast didn't consider Janu, who resembled him, so when Eldon, a handsome man was born, he was very interested in him, claiming that the child must be his to gain political power and legitimacy. The disgusting part of the story is that he hated the child who resembled him and liked the one who didn't. The fact that he couldn't feel love at all is a terrifying reality. Eldan being an Ain concealed himself and his surroundings as unexpected allies watched over him as a servant slave. When he was five years old, his nose and ears accidentally shifted shape. That's when Eldon realized she was his mother for the first time. Their relationship grew deeper as Eldan harbored aspirations of a mother-child bond like that. The protagonist was intrigued when he heard conversations about the Civil War. It seemed like some sort of succession crisis was happening with the man stating that it wasn't like that. Eldon just wanted to protect the people he loved. Jania and his people reported Eldon's true intentions to him in his anger. He declared that Eldon and all the other agents must die. This is why Eldon made the decision to fight for his goals and his people. After a bitter war, Eldon achieved his goals and owned his people, although he proclaimed himself as a feudal lord. Eldon apologized to his previous self because he was a man who married a new aunt he had just met since he married a new aunt. His children also became like that. He also added that Aruna had a very happy life, and he believed in her children would also have a happy life. Even though when he first saw Aruna, he was mistaken, thinking she was like that. They had the same thoughts and shared the same dreams. The protagonist himself admitted that he agreed too much with Eldon's dreams. The village society and the Ajin had been living in peace, so he thought it would be good if that scene could be spread further. That's why he wanted to support it and was ready to work together as much as he could. He also added that Eldon's dream about him being truly respected, so he asked him to hold his head up high. He asked Eldon if he thought it wasn't good to be a little braver, and that's how Eldon and the protagonist talked about all sorts of topics, going to food piles in each other's regions until the limit. Eldon told Dias that if he couldn't stockpile more food, 
It might become a problem as the population continued to grow. If he didn't put food production in place, the food wouldn't last long enough. This could be troublesome sooner or later. Winter was coming, and it would be bad if he didn't start preparing soon. That's why Eldon suggested that this time, let's try planting crops. He mentioned that before the war, he was entirely a farmer. He assured Diaz that he would show him how, so they could have one or two perfect harvests. After this conversation, Eldan left. When Diaz and Aruna returned, they saw the art and food waiting for them desperately. They burst out crying and scolding Diaz and Aruna. They had promised to return right away, but they didn't want to tell them the reason for their late return. However, no matter what they said, it just sounded like excuses. After some time, they comforted both daughters, and the girls finally fell asleep. Aruna said that they went berserk for a moment. They were sure our kids how happy their faces were when they said that their kids did nothing but run around, and until then, she always thought like that peaceful village was like a lie. And in the next day, Senai started crying when she ate Ihan's potatoes and was afraid she wouldn't be forgiven both lost crying and started fighting. And then Diaz offered his potatoes and asked her to put on makeup. But Ihan didn't want to eat the potatoes there. Sibling rivalry is increasing too intense. The crying incidents at night, the bedwetting incident, and then they drew something on Diaz's face, he was shocked, Aruna. Suddenly they had a high fever and we were there with them all day. Except on those days, it continued to be inconsistent. No one will hate them when we overcome the Senai incident, and Ihan's attitude began to gradually soften. Those faces started smiling more often. Aruna asked Dias that it would be better if they had scolded them both at least once Dias disagreed. He didn't think so affirming that they should apologize rather than scold. And besides, for kids who have just gotten a family, saying what they want to be wild and testing adults. All good things to try now better if they accept it. Except she realized that it might be a bad way to raise them, so starting tomorrow they should start scolding them properly. Suddenly, Aruna felt a group of people moving towards them. There are many intruders coming in from the southeast. Diaz asked her if she was sure enough that they were not Eldon's friends. Eldan appeared. Aruna stated that Eldon had already gone home, especially since he left in a different direction, and at this hour, usually people looking for prey, not honorable friends wandering around, so it's more likely to be a thief or bandit late at night. But Diaz wanted to check it out, even though it was already late at night. He had to go look for security. He asked Aruna to stay there and guard, but she refused and said she would accompany him. She reminded Diaz that it was a new moon night, so if he did it, there would be no reliable way for him to find her in the grassland at that time. The magic shouldn't be lacking, and if it's about guarding the house, Klaus could handle it. Suddenly, Klaus woke up feeling someone calling his name. Diaz agreed, and they went out of the house to search for the mysterious voice. Diaz asked Aruna to borrow her strength. Aruna and Diaz were discussing that the wealthy members of the Kajan race have a lot of livestock, and with that livestock, they are able to live off the income alone, while those who go hunting are poor people who do not have enough wealth before getting married. The men gathered engagement gifts, so Aruna confirmed that the fastest and easiest way out of poverty is to hunt bandits. However, in this area, bandits rarely appear. But they agreed, and said that in order for them to leave on their journey to visit their land, there is nothing there except grass, which directly means that these people may have an agenda with them. One of the enemy soldiers questioned whether there were people in the grassland since there wasn't even a single tree growing there. The leader silenced them and reminded them that he paid a lot of money to hire them and asked if they couldn't stop flapping their gums. They should give him the money back. The soldiers assured him that they would do the job properly and earn their income, but questioned if there were any specific reasons they had to do this at night without a moon. He mentioned that the patriotic hero is the type of opponent who can fight in front of the line in broad daylight and any time there is a sudden attack, he won't know about it. Because if he notices them, that's all he orders. If they see the guy, Eldan, anywhere, they have to finish him. He was told that he was in the grassland to meet Diaz. The soldiers questioned whether they would get more money if they did this. The female leader clarified that Eldan was worth 100 silver coins, 
and if they completed Dias, and they would get ten gold coins. They were all ready to fight Dias. The troops declared that this would be their biggest capture in a long time, as their opponent was only one person they wanted to end this and return as soon as possible. Suddenly, the female leader saw a red light, and she was curious about what they were getting attacked with. She understood that they had done it when she saw the arrow coming towards the light and ordered the troops to throw their torches away. If not, they would be the target. The soldiers ordered them to shoot back with arrows and aim at the man with it. He ducked and the red light suddenly disappeared. But to their surprise, the arrow was still coming, and it was so confusing where the arrow was coming from. The soldier pondered how he could attack in the darkness, how he understood it, where he thought it would be an easy victory. But it seemed that he took on an impossible job. The main soldier shouted at his troops that they couldn't sit still and shoot arrows back to ensure their aim was as accurate as they had enough hands, and the man was alone. The problem was, if they knew exactly where their target was, it would have been their victory. So he ordered everyone to pull him out with fire arrows. Suddenly, they heard a sound in front of them, and they didn't want to let that opportunity go. So they prepared for it, surrounding him. They were all desperately searching for him and wanting to teach him a lesson immediately. After that, the enemy counterattacked and everything was attacked at once. It was a battle more than the warrior had ever thought. He asked them all to stay alert. There were some dangerous enemies besides the archers, but their side had to do more, especially him. He asked them to enter the battle formation and wait. Suddenly, there was an explosion, and many more soldiers became martyrs. And this time, the red light turned into a green light. The soldier hesitated whether it was true or not, and he started running towards the light. As he approached, he saw the blue color of the customized iron armor and the giant two-handed axe. It was Dias he, punching the soldier very hard and making the soldier realize that this person was worth more than 100 gold coins. The woman was the only leader left in the army. He regretted paying all that useless person killed easily. It's easy for Dias to notice her. She'll be done. She starts running very fast in the middle of the forest and shouts his name. The woman's old scar throbs because she's done, just blocking her way. That's her only mistake, and she swears to finish it. One day, Dias mentions that she tells people with a torch in one hand. From now on, they start attacking, and their fight with the foolish bandits ends like this when the battle is happening. The enemy's arrow grazes Aruna's face, and she starts bleeding. Dias finally becomes a little anxious. He and Aruna don't get permanent scars, so it's okay according to them. The bandits have casualties, and unfortunately some are seriously injured and leave, but because so few escape, it's not worth chasing them. Dias instructs his troops to seize weapons from the bandits and he precisely educates them on how foolish the bandits' activities are no matter what. They saw him before deporting them from the grasslands. While Aruna said it wasn't a very good deportation with a sour face, they didn't have any victims. So she thought it was okay. Dias promised to do it if they were willing to try anything in his territory again. He wouldn't let them go easily. Aruna stated that hunting bandits was a good job and one could quickly make money from it. She suggested that if they could get money from the matriarch, they could also seize iron weapons and exchange them for money. While Dias questioned whether they could get money from those old weapons, Aruna suggested that in the grasslands, iron was a valuable material. So besides its value as a weapon, it could also be melted down and made into all kinds of tools. Why couldn't they sell it? Aruna admitted that she couldn't say her parents were rich, so her dream was to hunt a bandit crowd while pondering on it before meeting him. Aruna's life involved patrolling the grassland plain and hunting bandits. Hunting bandits was definitely the fastest and easiest way to lift herself out of poverty, but in this case, bandits in the grasslands were rarely found, and a big catch of bandits was just one example. She had dreamed of it before when Aruna sensed that the train picture had arrived there. Her heart was pounding as she thought bandits had finally arrived, but then she quickly realized that he wasn't a bandit. He doubted Dias was a refugee who was expelled from the train and would finish himself off whether he would finish on the roadside, is what she thought at that time. Then the next morning, he went to check on her while patrolling, and was silent when he found her sleeping there carefully.
as a precautionary measure that she decided on her own to find out if the result was a strong blue. She revealed it if she had it. If left alone, she would finish it and take her axe and armor. That's what she thought at the time, but in fact, she decided to wake him up and talk to her. She thought about the moment when she was about to finish it, but in the end, she didn't do it. She wasn't so sure about it, but when she realized it, she had already done it. As a result, Aruna obtained her current lifestyle, and that's what she believed, that her judgment was not wrong. There was still a time when suddenly they misunderstood each other. Looking at Dias with a red hue on her cheeks, she slowly approached him and kissed him, which surprised Dias. Aruna looked at him with affection and care, and he ran away from her, hesitating, leaving her empty and confused, while Dias asked her to stop and not leave him behind. Dias announced that he would continue to pursue Aruna no matter how dark the night was. He would be able to move forward as he illuminated his path. Eldon suggested to Dias that it's not just about increasing the population of thieves, that he really needs to ensure a larger supply of preserved food in case something happens. And he quickly runs out of food. It would be a disaster because winter seems to be far away, but it's closer than it seems. It would be bad if he doesn't start preparing now. He agreed with his suggestion and stated that they need to avoid a situation where their people starve. If the frontier population makes Aruna hungry, then Francis and Francoise's children will also go hungry. For the sake of everyone, he will go hunting and make more jerky. Eldon has determined that an unbalanced diet will have a negative impact on his health. He needs to keep various vegetables if he can and prepare some grains. So Diaz proposed that they should plow the grassland and make a vegetable field, but Eldon doubted it. Making a vegetable field would be difficult in the grassland because it hasn't rained until now. There will definitely be many people who accept the challenge of cultivating the land alone, and they will still fail. They are thinking of trying it, and Eldon, for Diaz's success, will work together as much as possible to overcome it. Diaz is sleeping at his house with his two daughters when suddenly he wakes up and realizes that he was dreaming. Diaz woke up in the morning and greeted Aruna, who greeted him back. Suddenly a few people passed by, teasing Aruna and Diaz because they seemed to be in a good mood, wondering if they had fun the night before. After a while, Klaus approached Diaz and reported that during the morning patrol, he encountered something that looked like a bat. He explained that it seemed to be flying with its colony when it attacked and brought down the rest of the colony. It seemed that they had already left. Klaus mentioned that he had never seen this type of bat before, and Klaus confirmed that he also did not have it. They agreed to be cautious about it. They all sat down together for breakfast under the clean blue sky without clouds. While eating, Dias asked if anyone had any specific information of interest or current physical issues. Everyone assured him that there were no problems at that time. In fact, he and the others were healthier than before. He connected this with Aruna's efforts with her herbal remedies. They consumed food infused with these herbs every day and bathed in medicine, which contributed to their improved health. He noted that compared to the Kajin village, they consumed a lot more. Furthermore, he asked Aruna about the source of the large supply of medicine. Aruna explained that it was either harvested or obtained through trading with peddlers. She suggested that the basic step was to process and increase their quantity. Dias asked if there were medicinal plant farms in Cajun Village. Aruna stated that they planted them as potted plants that could be moved around. They lived a lifestyle where they did not know when they had to leave their land. He revealed that he was indeed considering plowing the fields here, the grassland he wanted to harvest here, and provide a barn for everyone and secure life according to his wishes. Aruna to teach him how to cultivate the mapped herbal plants, he wanted to use it as a reference for making fields later. Aruna told him that he didn't know much about the techniques for it, and whether he really wanted to know all the details, he should better ask the leader's mother. When he arrived at the leader's residence, he was told that making a field was impossible. According to her, although she was not sure, she said the harvest results could hardly be planted in the grassland. She revealed that at one time her ancestors apparently used special techniques for farming, but in the tragic war, those techniques were lost, 
especially the matriarch asserted that teaching about planting medicinal plants was not a problem, since others said that planting plants in that way was difficult to do, but that was what she wanted to do, she just had to try it. The leader's mother handed over the plan for stone fertilizer to Dias and assured him that everything would go smoothly. The matriarch told Dias the procedure for cultivation, so he needed to break the stone fertilizer into several parts and then turn it into soil and then let it sit for a while before planting seeds or herbal roots. If he doesn't mix the mixture properly, the medicinal plants won't grow well or won't grow at all. Even so, if you try to plant vegetables, it will be a miracle if it goes well. The leader's mother warned Dias that even though he plowed the field and sowed the seeds, it would still be useless for him if he planted potatoes or soybeans in a pot. He could grow them up to the point of leaf buds, but from then on, they wouldn't produce seeds anymore. She said that the forest people might know something about where they live. The forest people are quite knowledgeable about the forest and plants. It is said that when the forest people wave their hands, even in the wildest conditions, most of the wild land suddenly overflows with greenery. Although the leader's mother has never seen its original form, she has heard that they live mysteriously. She asserts that when it comes to making crop fields, this is all they can do to help Dias. On that note, if he has found a way to do it very well, will he teach them all the basics needed to make crop fields in the grassland? It is his dearest wish for them, so he agrees. Actually, from the beginning, he intended to teach others if he became skilled in it, and if possible, he would like to have a large mountain of potatoes with the matriarch. The matriarch is very pleased with Dias the Blue and is looking forward to his success. Also, it was mentioned that Dias' children will have with Aruna and will be expected to succeed. Dias admitted that it was important to have the baby, so he needed the herbal potion, which would be very valuable. He had to give it to Aruna. However, Dias was worried about whether it was really necessary to give it to her. The mother leader said that it was natural for her and she wouldn't understand, so he had to make her understand and give it to her. After that, Dias returned home when he came back earlier that day. His daughter was very happy and welcomed him. When the girls saw the bag, the matriarch handed it to them and asked to see it. Dias opened the bag and asked what they thought of it. The girls made sour faces and confirmed that it was indeed just beautiful pebbles. They were not interested in those pebbles and found them rather boring, so they went to play with the livestock. At the same time, Aruna came and welcomed Dias. She asked about his bag and thought it was pebbles. She said it wasn't pebbles, but it looked like gemstones. Although she found them different from gemstones at first glance, she already knew they weren't magical because she couldn't feel any magic in them. According to Aruna, magical powers inherent or containers filled with magical energy could only be felt by looking at them. Even though they might look like gemstones, someone with magical powers would say they were just pebbles. This raised a question in Dias's mind. Since Aruna, does she have the horn owned by the magical powers also seem quite extraordinary for their age? And sometimes she can feel almost undetectable small amounts of magical power. From both, Aruna said that they both studied seriously so that they could become magic users even stronger than the leader's mother was very happy about it. Both girls experienced something extraordinary talent so far, so it doesn't matter what lifestyle. The two girls choose from now on. Their future will definitely be bright. One day they will spread their wings as strong magic users and explore the vast world that Dias used to be in a deep conversation with Aruna. When suddenly someone told them that there was something approaching them, Dias asked everyone to be careful. They observed a large colony of bats. Dias emphasized that the girls should take shelter in the tent and Klaus should be ready to leave with him. Klaus doubted that the bats came from the same colony he saw this morning and might be out for revenge against their enemies small. But there are too many of them, so their fighting style will be at a disadvantage. The bats attacked both of them, and they quickly retreated from the colony. Their leader moved towards Dias. Aruna shouted to encourage him, and the leader of the bats fell to the ground because the blind bats were sensitive to sound. That Aruna might have known that attacking them using magic to strengthen their voices would make them faint. It is allowing them to be defeated instantly. Aruna mentioned that it was easy to handle it like that. 
and even children could possibly deal with them and thank him for saving them after the battle, expressing his surprise at Aruna's extraordinary behavior. His voice apologized for mentioning it was rare for such a big catch to appear like that. He forgot to hold back. Dias asked what these monsters were called, but as Aruna spoke while his phone was still ringing in his ear, he couldn't hear what he was saying. Aruna smiled shyly and approached him, and she whispering something in his ear. Dia still unsure of what he said. He asked again, but Aruna ran back. Because she feeling embarrassed, while Klaus caught in a crossfire and fainted. As a result, the next day he was mixing something into a powder form. And finally finished, it's been five days since he started destroying those plants, the fertilizing stone he got from Moru. He finally finished destroying everything stone. And with that, he could finally start plowing his dream field first. He had to break the grass field, and then start processing the soil. Diaz thought of everything procedure in his mind. Suddenly, Aruna came and interrupted him, saying that he could feel a reaction to something approaching from the east. Both of them went to the grass field to check what was in. Aruna's magical perception was reacting some people and many horses, too. Something that was neither human nor horse approached them, just to make sure Diaz wanted to go and check it out. But it was unclear what object it was Aruna still didn't let him go alone. It felt reassuring when Aruna joined him. Aruna told him that they would be able to see people approaching them soon, and they became alert as they focused on the binoculars. Camelot shouted with joy Aruna that it was Eldon Camelot's servant. Aruna asked him to stop talking so dramatically while watching someone she knew Aruna took the binoculars from him while Dias questioned what that white creature was. Aruna said that they had brought a white mouse with them, some guards, and a lot of luggage, and that's the strange feeling. Aruna emphasized that the animal looked very similar to a black mouse called a white mouse, sarcastically asking what an easy name to remember. Aruna asked Dias if there was a small shadow moving in the second cart in his bag. If they secretly reached the peak of the situation outside, it would be confusing. And she stated that she would ask Camelots what he kept inside the carriage that was being discussed, some mice things that might be their shadows. The mouse confirmed that at some point he got caught by a slave hunter, and he didn't know what would happen next. So he sneaked into this carriage heading to the desert, hoping somehow he could return to his hometown. And that's what he thought. Bring some soybeans. Suddenly, another mouse came and interrupted, questioning who he was. The little mouse stated that he was just sharing a little food, while the other mouse suggested that it was dead weight. They didn't need it. The little mouse asked if it was true that they would need some food supplies for a long journey if they got off the train. They didn't know when they would get food in their hands again. So they had to prepare the food properly there, while another mouse warned him that he didn't realize it. But this train wasn't heading to the southern desert, but to the west. He had a little wisdom in reading characters and books, but in the end he was an idiot who returned to the desert was a lie. The real goal was to kill the dragon. If they defeat the human who killed the dragon, their power will be the same. It will become clear. The little mouse emphasized that he shared his knowledge with the other mouse, thinking everything would return to the desert together. He cooperated because he was told it was a plan to board the train to leave the other mice who wanted that honor that could be boasted by the desert residents. He tried to take it back. The little mouse mentioned that his opponent was the dragon slayer. If stronger than a dragon, it would be impossible for them to win. The other mouse declared their pride in their desert citizenship and their clan. The honor of humans was cunning and deceitful, but they were worn out and even weak. The dragon slayer was just as weak as the others. The little mouse stated that humans were liars who had deceived them all. The mouse that defeated them was the right path, believed to be of higher rank than humans, even higher than the dragon slayer they were aiming for. Making the people realize it, they returned to the desert with food, things they dedicated to both. Kamalots ordered his men to stop the cart. Dias greeted them, and Aruna greeted them because they had stepped aside to meet them. He made sure that they had brought the promised items by Eldan. The mouse heard Dias's name, and immediately thought that Dias was a dragon slayer. Dias was very curious. He knew it was true. 
He skipped the pleasantries but wanted to ask Camelots about something. The mouse in the cart was small, stopping everyone, saying it was impossible for them to win against the opponent that referred to Dias. When Dias approached the cart, he was confused if there was something inside. As soon as Dias opened the cart, the mice attacked him, thinking their opponents were helpless. It was real, and it was their chance to defeat the dragon slayer. While shocked that the mice could talk, Aruna came and saved Dias from all the mice. She scolded Dias for his reckless behavior, but let the mice think that they might belong to Kamalots. So he might not have to hurt the mice again by stating that they did not belong to anyone and should not be made by anyone. Excitedly, the mice marked Aruna as a rude woman provoking Dias, and she said she was an amazing woman and would not forgive any insults. Kamalots was clueless about the situation, not knowing what was happening, but before he could find out anything, he ordered his men to defend Aruna and Dias, and also to capture those stupid mice until not a single mouse was left, captured in cloth, and they screamed inside the despicable human. Camelot's apologizes for the inconvenience of asking if there is an apology he can offer to do something right. Dias and Aruna said there was no need to apologize unless Camelot's insisted, stating that staying with them if the subject wanted to hunt Dias as a representative of Eldan, he would do so. There is no reason not to apologize. As Dias heard those names, he wasn't sure what they were talking about, maybe referring to the Hujan's thoughts. Dias's appearance is fully identical to animals if they have a settled culture they bring with them and can communicate with words. Then they race as equal as mentioned. Dias is reminded of the myth his parents told him that words are an intelligence granted to humanity by God, so only humans can speak. In other words, it is something important and makes sense. If so, the rats are humans. The Camelots explained that the people of the race known as the Great Rat-Eared Race compete with the people referred to as desert dwellers, what they claim, but there are still many other races living in the desert. The confusing desert with Eldon's shape, as he had never heard of deserts in the Kingdom of Camelots, clarified that they simply referred to it as the homeland desert where the people lived, an area from the southernmost tip of the kingdom to the desert belt, which could be considered an even further southern area. Eldan believed there were slave hunters there, and he put them under his protection until they could do it themselves. They could return to the desert. He promised them, except the rat race didn't trust mixed humans like them, so they opposed it. Even though Eldan opposed it accepting criticism and rebellion, he told them that he would treat them as brothers providing warmth and protection to them very respectfully. Meanwhile, Camelots revealed that because Eldan became the feudal lord, and they began to say that on the day they returned to the desert, it was close. Meanwhile, Aruna observed that Camelots was previously white, but now it was blue, and because it was blue, they decided to let it go and forgive it without compensation. But they were worried the rats were a strong red color, so if they saw it again, they wouldn't want to hold it back but Dias said it before. But he told Camelots again about this issue. He didn't need to apologize and confirmed that they knew the feeling was enough for them because he insisted they would accept his apology. Camelots revealed their words and behavior were quite a lot of trouble. And if something happened next time, even he would. But he suggested being careful to ensure that something like this wouldn't approach them both again. At the same time, Dias handed over their punishment to Camelots understanding and praising Dias for his humble words. One of Kamalots's subordinates came and informed them that they had finished visually surveying the area this time through scent. It became complicated as the smell was everywhere and the cargo, including a large amount of spices, was analyzed. Kamalots assessed the situation and went to check the results. He also looked into the cart, but in the end, there was nothing abnormal. The examination concluded that everyone was in the clear. The rat people were sent back to Eldan to interrogate them to find out the reason for attacking Dias, which became a higher priority than giving them the appropriate punishment. On the way, Dias asked Camelots about the spices mentioned by his guard earlier, and if he remembered that conversation correctly. He should have brought the farming tools. Camelots confirmed that he forgot to explain due to the unfortunate incident 
that they were preparing farming equipment for him. Furthermore, there was an envelope related to the spices that everyone meant he asked to read it. It was a letter from Eldon, and it said, My dear Dias, this is about our farming tools. We discussed it for now we are trying to provide whatever we can get our hands on and hope it will be enough. If it's not sufficient, then he will prepare more for you. He informed them that they also experienced it, including some of their local specialty spices. The cart and the horse carrying the goods were also for them. Eldon hoped that from now on, there would be smooth two-way dialogue and trade. The conversation between us a few days ago was very valuable and extraordinary. He was eagerly looking forward to their meeting again sometime. Bass is grateful for everything, even though he explained it clearly. All these round items are gifts. No payment is needed. He treats it as evidence of their friendship and is asked to accept it without hesitation. Camelot's revealed that Eldon had confirmed giving livestock and horses when they had no warehouse problems in May. So they prepared some construction materials and were asked to feel comfortable and hand over all their construction to them when he received the request letter he owned. There was no way to repay the favor, and in that case the raw materials from the Earth Dragon would be the most suitable according to him, especially since Camelot stated that from now on if they wanted to try traveling, they might take control of one of the carriages. It belongs to them, and it would be a great opportunity to learn how to handle it all. The beautiful swift horse assured Dias that under the guidance of the coach, he could definitely handle it in a short time. Aruna was so emotional when she talked about it. They really have horses now, especially the four of them are there. She is the happiest, getting four horses. She is filled with excitement like her heart has never been happier before. Dias knows that for the common people, Oni's horse is very important for combat transportation and mobility. Its value is the same as or greater than M if it is a fast horse, then its value will be high because it has a lot of land. Horses are a sign of wealth, and the Aruna family has horses but no wealth. They are doing their best by borrowing horses from other households. Aruna is thinking about her family. Her heart might be filled with all kinds of emotions since childhood. Her dream is to be a woman from a family that owns horses. Dias has masculinity, and he too eagerly awaits the day he will receive something he never thought his wish would come true so quickly. Aruna thanks Dias, her future husband. She assures him to take care of the horses and handle the carriage whenever he says that she hugs Dias with a strength. That feels like 100 horses while Dias tries to calm her down. Meanwhile, a little mouse hiding in her heart thinks that maybe it finally happened to be silent, maybe given by another mouse on their hunt. She rushes to hide because she thinks they will find her. But she is happy because no one else can do the same thing. Everything seems fine. She thinks she should get out of there soon and try to open the cart. Suddenly she realizes something above the carriage. She sees Dias and becomes scared. And the next day, Senai calls Ihan and shows some black tea leaves, suggesting that they put it in a small pot to get the leaves for both of them, and it smells very good. She think it would be better if they get the seeds go with black tea, as their mother and father like black tea, in the field of Iluk. The leader's mother is teaching Dias to farm, advising him to hold the handle firmly, and after finishing walking and telling G to walk by calling him, I noted that G apparently used for that field work. So everything has to go smoothly. He understands the process and follows the existing procedures. There is an agricultural tool called a plow, that has extraordinary abilities to cultivate the land without cutting the grass. With that, he can move forward and prepare the fields for planting. Well, Grandma ordered them to do it, let the inverted land rest for a while and suggested planting seeds in it after three days. The field land is divided into two parts. The plowed land is mixed with water and plant fertilization under the ground with stone powder. Next to it, there is a field that has ash and mixed water. Apparently in the village where the grain comes from, they use ash to make the soil fertile. The grandma mentioned that despite all the talk about things that cannot grow on grasslands, she thought about it after seeing the results of all their hard work. She believes they should dig a temporary reservoir while waiting. She asked if they meant they didn't have enough water, unless grandma said it didn't mean they were okay for now, but currently there is no water. The village's water comes from a well in a small river near the village, 
but the river is narrow so it might dry up in the summer. The well will be fine for daily water use, but it does not provide the amount of water needed for the fields. So, just in case, they need to make a reservoir for preparation. When they didn't have enough water for the field that understood everything, if they made a reservoir it would be fine at the same time. Sinai and Aihan came and asked if he had finished making the field. While Diaz confirmed that it was not over yet, and would soon be over needing a few more days to finish it. He asked if there was something he needed and revealed that Aruna had finished cooking food. So he said he was going home calling both girls a little hesitant and for some reason. They both suddenly acted strange. The girls asked Diaz if the field was good and tough and if he was tired. Diaz confirmed that if it was a job like this, then it wasn't as difficult as that and he wasn't as tired. The girls questioned whether the field was not good. They would be sad. While Diaz answered them positively that he would not let that happen. They did all they could. And if the result was bad, then there was nothing they could do it with an artful pause questioning, what if they had any secrets? Diaz said it might be sad if they did hide something bad, but it's okay. Everyone has one or two secrets, so he would do it. Don't be sad if they hide something. Diaz somehow felt like the girls were asking unrelated questions to what he got curious about their condition. So at every opportunity he kept asking himself about what was related to that question, he hadn't even found the answer yet. Aruna didn't know what it meant, and the other villagers also asked them, but they didn't want to explain their vague words at all. It was an event that caused all sorts of worries, but while watching them happily continue as usual. He thought that it might be like kids around that age would have things like these. Things that in the end, he should have forgotten about after a while. Aruna stated that the land should have rested for three days, so now let's start planting seeds today. She brought a fast-growing herbal potion. If the plant's fertilization with stone is effective, it will start sprouting the next day, and this should be enough to test the effectiveness of the field. In one day, sprouts will already start growing and the stone fertilization is amazing. He is looking forward to the results tomorrow. At the same time, Klaus came there to report that Camelots and the company had finished their stable, which was quite surprising to Diaz because it hadn't been exactly three days since they started building it. So, how exactly did they build it? The reason for their speed is apparently that they used pre-production materials. It just needs to be assembled for that method. The construction variability is easy to adjust. The number of livestock, the location of the building, and the addition or dismantling are also easy to do. Apparently, this is their preferred construction method from a neighboring country. Diaz thanked Kamalots for their help, while he emphasized that he was only following Eldan's orders because Diaz didn't discuss the cost with them as a sign of appreciation. He prepared the raw materials that they placed there so they could freely ask whenever they needed the ingredients. The earth dragon was like what Camelots and his friends heard. They rejected the raw materials, stating that they couldn't accept a large amount of raw materials. They questioned if he had some hidden motive for having them transported only after he wrote a power of attorney for its contents. Did they finally accept it and get it? They treated it not as a gift, but as something that needed to be taken care of. Sometimes they could use it practically for the benefit of both parties. The next day, Camelots and his company were ready to do it. Camelots declared that their task was done, so they would leave and depart. They returned, thanking for all their care. While the two girls, Senai and Ihan, became too emotional, like Camelots and the others. He saw them and thought when they first met him, the two girls were friendly with strangers and couldn't greet people properly. But over time, with everyone together, their hearts opened. Now they were unbearably sad to see them go. Aruna lightened their burden and explained that they shouldn't cry forever, especially now that they were done escorting them. They had to go back to take care of the horses, and if they weren't in a hurry, the horses would cry hungry or thirsty. As the girls heard that, they remembered they had to go and feed the horses, so they ran out of the cave, confirming that the field would leave. Now they felt very upset when they saw the field was very dry and looked dead. Dias remained hopeful and said that some things didn't go well the first time. They might not have given the land. There was not enough time to rest, 
so they had to replant and check the results the day after tomorrow. When they saw that the field was still dead and abandoned, they thought that maybe they didn't use enough stone fertilizer for the plants and just needed to add a little more. So they mixed the stone fertilizer again and spread it all over the field. The next day, there was no change in the field, and the harvest results were still the same. Diaz thought that there were still some plants that didn't receive enough stone fertilizer, and they needed to increase the quantity even more. They mixed more stone fertilizer and spread it in the field again. It was disappointing when they came to see the harvest results in the field, as they were still the same. Diaz was frustrated, but he didn't give up. He thought that he needed to increase the amount of stone fertilizer, maybe twice as much as yesterday or even three times more. Aruna asked him to stop mentioning that he had tried enough and should accept a break now. Mixing so much stone fertilizer into the soil would be bad for it in the end. Besides, Dias agreed and told him that even though the seeds they planted were like that, it was all in vain. He would try his best to find a different job. They returned to the tent from the field, and the girls saw that they were upset and worried. This made them unhappy too, as they wanted to help their parents and figure out how they could assist. Suddenly they heard a voice from the other tent, the voice of a stranger asking for help, so they went to meet him outside. His voice was very loud, and someone desperately asked to be allowed out of that place, and it turned out to be a little mouse. It had been about a week since he got trapped there, even though mice can go without drinking water for a long time. He had reached his limit, and couldn't take it anymore, because it had been like this all along. Honestly, he wanted to help Dias, the dragon slayer, while screaming and begging for help from Ihan and Senai. They stepped inside, and the mouse asked if there was anyone who could fulfill his desperate plea to be freed from there. Senai and Ihan understood that there was something inside the mouse, and confirmed that he was indeed inside the wooden box and couldn't get out because of the belongings on top of the lid. The girls urged him to wait as they tried to get him out, but it turned out to be too heavy for them. Senai couldn't lift it herself, and they were both afraid that everything might fail if they tried. The little mouse panicked and asked if they were children, begging them not to attempt something beyond their abilities and if possible, to call an adult. But there were no adults available. Everyone was busy working, so it wasn't the right time. The mouse worried and exclaimed that it would be bad if they got hurt and he could hold on a little longer. The girls reassured him that they would be fine and were almost ready to try one last time. When the box was opened, the little mouse thanked and cried, explaining that she was trapped there and it was really difficult. She owed her life to the girls who introduced themselves as Sinai and Ihan. They were happy to meet her and asked for her name. Ihan praised her for her glasses, saying they suited her well. The mouse revealed that the book she brought was handmade. Aruna asked if he was a merchant. The mouse introduced herself as a merchant of the rat race and her name was Amer Jerryboa. When they were on the subject, she said she was quite a woman and an adult. Meanwhile, in the field, he still hoped with a little adjustment that could be done. Aruna asked him to stop while looking like a child doing it, saying Dias believed they might get better results if they changed locations. Meanwhile, the girls asked why Amer was there and if she was punished for something bad. Amer told them the whole story. It was nonsensical, she explained, and would take quite a while for them to read it if they wanted to. She explained the whole story to them. The acquaintance wanted to do something bad, but it was just a misunderstanding. He was the one who did it and got punished. She was scared and tried to escape, so she hid in the nearest box. But then a heavy suitcase was placed on top of it so she couldn't get out. That's the whole story. The girls asked her if she wasn't friends with Dias. Amer never talked to him, so they weren't friends. The girls insisted they wanted to ask him for advice, but she didn't know Dias or the others. It would be a secret. Amer requested for someone more suitable in the village so they could go alongside the girls they met for the first time. The girls refused, unable to ask anyone else in the village about it. She would be fine, but they couldn't go to Aruna, even though they loved her so much, or Francis or Francoise as they wished. They might find out that Dias worked hard every day, but the reality was that it was useless. 
He was exhausted there. They explained that the Earth's surface had no power. Dia's method was not good, and he might soon become completely drained. The problem was that they couldn't do anything about it. It was something they couldn't show to humans. The girls emphasized that their parents said the power to protect the forest must exist. They should never tell humans about this power because if humans found out about this power, they would misuse it. You must not show your power to them. That was the last promise they made to their parents, unless the girls wanted to help DS because Amer was not human. They could tell him about it. Amer asked if they could tell him more details about the story. The girls explained the whole process to Amer, and he agreed to help them and arrange things. Amer asked if they came from the forest people race, which was confirmed by the girls that they came from a forest community that lived in and protected the forest. Amer understood that the people who lived in the forest protected and cared for it, and the power called nurturing was very important to the people there. The girls further explained that when the forest society thought they were nearing the end of their power storage, they would plant their power in seeds. These seeds were planted in an important place, and they grew into trees. These trees formed the forest when they were on the verge of death. They entrusted their seeds to their loved ones, so that one day it could become a forest entrusted to the people. Protect and nurture them, making a forest from one seed to one tree growing and maturing. It was something that touched their hands and the feelings they had. Its existence was similar to a tombstone. It also had an existence like a book, where you could learn knowledge from it. They also felt a connection to the family tree, where they could feel their blood vessels. It was believed to protect those trees. The forest people lived in the forest, so they had two powers, Senai and Ihan. The first strength is spreading magical power to accelerate the growth of vegetation. Their second strength is building barriers to protect against diseases and foul air known as miasma. Their purpose is to protect the forest and preserve it. Amer basically understands everything while the girls assert that Amer is indeed very smart. Amer thinks Senai and Ihan are both still inexperienced and cannot yet create a forest, but they can grow shoots from tree seeds. If they give it their all, they can build a small barrier. If they continue doing it every day, they can nurture a tree at a surprisingly fast rate. Their obstacles may be small, but they are actually vigilant against diseases, he thinks. It's an extraordinary ability that Amer reflects on. Humans don't know what abilities they promise. The elders hide those abilities, but how do they eventually live together with Dias and the others? He thinks that's the best way to hide their magical powers. They will stay somewhere without any humans around. C reveals that even they were afraid of Dias at first, but since his hands are kind, his voice is just like their parents, even though his sweat never smells bad. He thinks he's so much better compared to the people back home who are super nice, so they think they will be able to stay there. Even the others are good too, so it's a good place. So, these are all the reasons why it's not a problem to talk about their powers with him. They want to protect their promise to their parents and also want to use their powers to help Dias, so they seek advice on how to work together without breaking that promise. Amer questions whether this is the reason the Earth's surface powers have been drained, and that's why the forest people need energy to create fields. Well, that's what the girl said here. The Earth's surface doesn't have the power or the will to drain any energy if it spreads magic. It will disappear soon. They will need a barrier so that it doesn't get drained. Amer questioned what kind of phenomenon they were experiencing. He thought that if they knew the nature of the phenomenon, they could take some preventive measures. But the girls just said that they didn't care. They didn't care. They knew a lot about it and stated that the bad kids might be able to do it. The girls said that if everything gets drained, it's just sand. That's how they want to be easygoing because they want to save Francis and the others. Amer expressed that it was a reasonable explanation from the girls, but it seems like they don't know anything concrete about who they're talking about. It's almost like someone causing some kind of natural barrier phenomenon that stops the change of the desert land and makes it difficult for it to grow natural wither and vegetation, but it's still part of Amer's thinking that it's impossible. When considering protection against barriers from the forest community, it might be some kind of strange plant disease or maybe poison. The monster is up to no good. 
things they need to talk about how they will use the barrier powers without getting caught. Amor suggested they secretly use one of them. While Dias and the others are not around the field, but the girls refused, saying that she is always in the field. After working, everyone came back together until bedtime. Amor then questioned how they would do it in the middle of the night while others were asleep. The girls rejected the plan. They were also asleep at night and woke up while they were sleeping. Could Amor ask to show them where they live and he would wake them up secretly? The girls were excited. The plan was ready. They were happy to do it, asking for his advice. Amor found them really confused about what to do, and he was glad he listened to their story. He called them and repeated the entire plan, except the girls were so busy celebrating that they finally got a plan to help Diaz. Amor urged them to calm down for a moment, but they didn't even listen, unsure about it. In the middle of the night, Amor left the tent and felt alive in the open area. He quietly entered Diaz's tent through the hole the two girls opened for him. He saw Diaz, who was the dragon slayer, and then he intended to sneak carefully without him noticing, but for some reason, he sneezed. He tried to control it but couldn't, yet no one woke up recently. Diaz is working in the field so the smell becomes stronger, just like the words of Art and Amor approached the girls and whispered for them to wake up. It's time to go to the fields as decided. They said they would help Diaz, so if they don't wake up soon, the day is already morning and then they won't be able to help. Amor kept trying to wake them up, and finally the girls opened their eyes and woke up. They still felt sleepy and confused about what was happening above them in the dark of night, and both girls felt scared to comfort them. Amor asked what they usually do when the day is dark and they have to go to the toilet. The girls revealed that it was good Aruna, or they followed along with them holding their hands, and after this, the girls took out some seeds they owned. Their father's seeds and Ihan had their mother's seeds. They held them and said that the seeds helped them receive happiness from their parents, because their mother and father loved it. They always tried like that together, and sometimes, while holding hands like that, they would start to get chatty. Then they arrived at the field. He made Amor unable to see the problem there, but the girls started their work. They chanted magical spells, and beautiful light shone throughout the light spreading from the sky between them, shortly after the lights went out disappeared, as if sinking into the ground. The girls completed their magic spell finally, and they were able to do it again from the field. It was already dark outside, and they had worked hard, so they wanted to go back to Y. Amor questioned whether the barrier had been completed and if they were ready to go home. If so, their role was done. The girls went back home and went straight to their beds. Amor was between them and sat there, asking them to separate like that. He found the girls resting in their beds and asleep. Amor was trapped between them. She insisted to let her go, but since they were already asleep, they didn't hear her. The next day, the city was buzzing with excitement at a certain bar. Some people were discussing Eldon. They mentioned that he would go to the next imperial capital. They said that no matter what, as the ruler of the region, he had to be officially accepted by the king. He brought back the earth dragon stone magic from another dragon slayer. People said that if he presented that magic stone to the king, it would surely leave a good impression and maybe help with peace and security. Kazdek's Fum still doubted that they would be close to humans again. It was very rare for them to hear that the dragon slayer had a wife. Instead of meeting secretly, they usually teased each other in front of others. They reminded me that if they could remember. The dragon slayer came from the eastern region, and people from the east are known for their hatred towards I2. According to rumors circulating until recently, the dragon slayer had never heard of or seen before, and maybe the dragon slayer married the first imagine he saw. Eldan and the friendship of the dragon slayer is everything thanks to his wife. One of them questioned what might be the race of the dragon slayer's wife, is not sure about the details, but apparently they knew that she had horns. Apparently, the dragon slayer fell in love at first sight, and eventually liked this person so funny. How he is a dragon slayer but can't win against a woman. It seems humans fall in love with a rhinoceros beast man. Besides that, Others asked if anyone saw the recruitment billboard for thieves. 
that the Dragon Slayer murder made a message stating that race doesn't matter. No cruel or evil people allowed, and food and lodging provided by the Dragon Slayer, some small dogs couldn't divert their gaze from him. They're talking about small big rats with ears attacking them, and there are rumors of raids. Some people called themselves tried by the monkey tribe to incite violence. He lion thought a person confirmed that he had never heard of them before, while others expressed that people said so, we just avoid responsibility. No one if not. The others are their allies and not someone else claiming to be part of the monkey tribe. People who proclaim themselves as monkey tribe must exist somewhere within them. He is a tall man with his face and body covered in black rat cloth. Those rats always swallow the belongings of that suspicious man. Suddenly they remembered a man who matched the description. They believed that Juan was an idiot so easy to deceive. According to them, the conversation didn't matter how much gold coins we showed them. They never lent an ear to anything we said. In the end, it was uniquely easy to fool them, a failure that no one else had. They believed in them from the beginning, and the poison would have a bad effect in the Eastern Kingdom. Two people discussed that there were more and more dissatisfied people coming to Dias's faction. The second person asked if they would come again even though the faction had no money or power from the beginning, but it felt like it had reached the final stage. Then it confirmed that the main faction wanted him to control the western commercial area, but he was rejected by the Duke of Kazdek. He questioned whether the next candidate for the throne was Richard. Others have stated that it is quite a mysterious question, since it is Mazer and Helena has not given up yet, and from now on can go in any direction depending on their actions, just like Richard did, who was a great ally in that religious institution. The duke who has occupied the territory becomes an ally to Isabel, so the chances for them are not too bad, agreeing as the Duke of Kazdek's mason and questioning who he is to him. Others refuse to say that the Duke of Kazdek also died from illness. It seems that the second son will follow in his footsteps. He puts some distance between himself and Mason. Instead, the questions what happened to the eldest son, and it is revealed that his eldest son also died from the same illness. It is a typical and widespread disease in terms of mobility, which is inherited by the Duke of Kazdek. The second son comes out of here aligning himself with the changes with the fact that the friendly second son obtained from that man. Their territories are neighbors and they depend on their bond of friendship, almost as if they were foster brothers. Bound by an oath, that person becomes a thief lord of the grasslands, and if he remembers correctly, it is the west neighbor of Kazdek. Less than a month later, he becomes someone deadly cursed by Seraph, questioning whether the curse he received is about the harvest, not growing and if he builds a house or fortress, they will soon burn them both. They discuss this matter wherever the case may be. The actions of the second son and Dias will affect the direction of king, but none of them have ever met Dias. But when they remember they had heard that he was charming and mostly harmless type of guy, that we could call by nickname, suddenly a soldier came there. He asserted that Dias led a quite large number of troops, and they seemed to appear out of nowhere. The boy said that it was normal, and that he shouldn't make as much money as that fuss about it. The soldier informed that Dias brought nearly 20,000 soldiers with him. He also brought supply of supplies and supply cart tents with him. He asked if there was a war happening somewhere, but the kids said that 200 was just a little more than. One would need for war, while the one who brought Dias questioned whether running wild was okay or not. Anyway, someone would do it maybe eventually getting him. The next morning, Aruna noticed there was a noise inside the Sinai place that seemed to be owned by both of them. They moved in the middle of the night. Suddenly, she saw Aimer sleeping there. She screamed so loudly, even he woke up the next morning. Several incidents occurred in the village, and the atmosphere there was like a rabbit surrounding the place. The first incident happened when the art and sleep with the mouse before the deadly disease occurred. The mouse that was found was brought to bed, said Aruna angrily. Both of them, along with the captured American mouse, were given a medical bath. The whole body came out with a box of seeds and pigeons there understood the reason for the scream he heard. He nodded and said that he was worried it might happen by chance. It was their return who attacked him before, but Aruna told him not to worry because Aimer was a strong blue. 
The second seed produced their seeds in the field yesterday. The budding seed is something that naturally happens in a perfect circle. The difference between the field and grandma's field is mixed into the soil, so the question arises why the difference is ignored in the green plants that appear in the circle. It's a pretty strange and weird story. The noisy bird plans to steal the new sprout. The pigeon asked if she could understand it, but she said she wouldn't be able to do such a thing. The fairy tale feet, and confirmed that Dias always said strange things like that. The third part seems trivial, but Sinai and Ihan are spreading items inside the warehouse to save her. When finished cleaning the warehouse, but he thought it would be an awkward meal with the scattered soybeans, and they were originally in the trunk. Amor dropped on the other side. He thought throwing it away would be a waste. The pigeon agreed with him and said that the delicious soybeans would surely be wasted if thrown away, just like he wanted to eat them. Dias emphasized that actually his visit was the biggest event of the day. He was confused about what to do with the soybeans. Meanwhile, the pigeon realized the situation and introduced himself as Grant. He was a servant of the people of Eldan and committed that he was the main leader of the pigeon people since then. Grant kept asking about the cause of the uncomfortable atmosphere, and Da kept answering everything. Suddenly, Grant remembered that he forgot to do something very important. He said that Eldon had written to him about an urgent matter that needed to be done. Dias was asked to open it. There were three letters. The first one was an apology for the incident of the big-eared mouse and some announcements about it. The perpetrator was instigated by someone in a black belt, so he asked Dias to be careful and remember it. The second one was about the tumultuous events happening in the capital city. Its contents were like the third Princess Dias gathering troops and weapons, the goal was unclear, and so on. Eldon asked Dias to be careful, and the third letter about the recruitment billboard thief mentioned a group of small-sized dogs who had gained interest. The accumulated profit had become a significant issue, so he needed to consider the pros and cons of accepting them. The letter was the only one with its seal, and it somehow looked like the most important problem Diaz had asked Heba about the small size mentioned in the letter. He said that he had met some dogs before, but he couldn't remember anything about small-sized breeds. Among dogs, there are known to be both large and small sizes. The larger dogs are intellectually stronger and physically more powerful, resembling humans in shape. On the other hand, the dogs Diaz encountered were likely to be larger in size. He added that, conversely, small-sized dogs have a similar size in their original form. Their personalities are mostly instinctive, and they have weak hands, which makes them quite timid. They mature very quickly and have many offspring. Since ancient times, they have decided to lead their own lives here. After visiting and listening to the conversations of the large-sized dogs, fortunately, People can also put up billboards for them. When they talked about it, the small-sized dogs also felt the desire to join because of their awkwardness. The small-sized dogs had a little trouble when it came to work. Grant said that they would take care of their food and board because they didn't have a way to do it themselves. They wanted to know if the situation was something that motivated them to come there. They agreed and stated that if he obtained everyone's approval in the village, everyone would accept it. So, until he heard news from everyone, he asked Grant to wait there and offered to take the soybeans. After that, he approached everyone to ask for their opinions, but many of them accepted the plan. They said it could increase the number of potential thief soldiers, and if it made the place more lively, they should implement it. When he moved towards the field, he even asked his grandmother's opinion. Since then, he was busy checking the land. He said if Dias was okay with it, he was okay with it, so he asked everyone else and didn't get it. Dias returned home and saw Aruna scolding her children, asking them why they brought a mouse in the year. He wasn't angry, but worried about them. When the three of them saw Dias coming, they became silent and started discussing the issue about the dog with them. All the girls became excited when they heard that a group of dogs would be there. Upon arrival, Aruna said that it ruined the atmosphere for her to give a lecture. Dias questioned who she was talking to the girls about. She explained that she was trying to get them to reflect on what they had done. Dias insisted that they were being stubbornly quiet and didn't want to tell her the reason. He added that if they both insisted like this, they wouldn't say why. 
there might be a good reason not to say it. He didn't know what they were hiding, but whatever they did. He didn't think they had bad intentions, so he asked Aruna to wait until they discussed it sometime in the future. Aruna agreed. Dias analyzed that the only decision from the long-eared mouse known as Aimer was strong blue, and both of them became friends with it. At some point, even though they listened to all of Aruna's lectures, she looked very different from the others. Dias asked Aimer why she was there. Aimer started explaining and warned that it could take a little longer. And then she told him everything. Following that, Grant flew carrying a letter addressed to Eldon, hoping that the letter would reach Eldon's home on the same day as the sunset. The letter entrusted to him involved the acceptance of the dog people and the small conditions related to it. He also wrote about her being there and staying for a short while. Then, when Aimer confirmed that she was under his care from now on, according to the person in question, she wanted to stay in a similar village. Aimer loudly told the situation to himself and his family at that time. Somewhere he exclaimed that he wanted to stay in the Iluk village. When asked why, he stated that he wanted to be by the side of Sinai and Ahen. Their strength, or rather, from now on, he wanted to oversee their growth as he had developed an interest in them. Dias understood him with things like reading, writing, arithmetic, or whatever scientific knowledge he pursued. He might be useful, for example, as a tutor for both of them. Aimer pleaded for whatever reason he would do his best and asked to let him live there. He said that if he went there, the neighbors would steal it. Then Eldon would tell him to go back to his hometown and so on. He wanted to stay there. Dias analyzed that his desire was very strong, so he introduced him to the other village. He went around asking people for their opinions, and most of them were positive and had no issues except for Aruna. He asked Dias with a bitter face how he could let a mouse live in his house. Aimer explained that the desert dwellers live a hygienic life. The style he asked for should not be equated with other rodents, promising to maintain a hygienic lifestyle with that one additional condition. Aruna agreed and became a big-eared mouse. Aimer's Jerry Boa became a resident of Iluk village and a part of their community. After that, they returned to Aimer's place and noticed that some packages had gone missing. One hidden barrel of wine was in the midst of all the disappearances. Aimer became excited and declared that he could hear everyone's voices from there, saying that Dias would use it too. Aimer thought this was a welcome party for him and he was very happy, asking them to quickly go there as well. When they arrived behind Aimer, Aruna was preparing food and art, and her sister was putting canaries in the food again. Grandma needed something and it belonged to Aimer. This was the first time Aimer saw all of this, and Dias told him that they had a jar of sugar there so they might make something with it. Aimer jumped off Dias's shoulder and went to meet Grandma to ask if he could have a taste. Dias saw Aruna doing that preparation, and also keeping it a secret from her, while Aruna asked if he was surprised and agreed because he didn't know when she made all those preparations. Aruna stated that good things had been happening lately one by one, so when Grandma suggested holding the dinner party, it was the right time because she was busy. So Aruna used her own judgment and decided that they should start preparing at some point. When she was writing her letter, Aruna caught him hiding alcohol without telling her. The kingdom law decided that only 18-year-olds and above could drink alcohol once, saying that alcohol was poisonous or a bad habit because the body had not fully developed until then. Minors did not have a place to live. That was the reason given to adults who were 18 years old, also had a sense of responsibility, and when they became adults, they were able to restrain themselves. Not sure what the rules were for the Oni people, but Aruna was 15 years old and she worried that she had ever experienced drinking alcohol, but she hid the alcohol while thinking about it. Aruna would be angry if Dia said that. It seemed like he had no reason to get angry about anything. He questioned whether he really did it because he thought about it. They had known each other for so long, and he expected that Dias should at least know that she said preparing the party without permission was a little revenge for it. From now on, he hoped she would ask for further advice. They were already married. However, Aruna reminded him that they were talking about the issue of stray dogs in detail. But when she thought about it, she felt somewhat sad. She emphasized 
that if he was concerned about it, then she wanted to say something to him because they were husband and wife. She wanted them to discuss many things more and more in this way. They decided to start doing it now and immediately discuss the alcohol problem. Aruna meant that alcohol is bad because it is actually foolish for the body. Alcohol is good for the body, she continued to explain that it is a nutritious habit for people who drink squid and strengthens them against diseases, especially for families who have horses and give them weaned babies. Dias was shocked to know that they were giving alcohol to the baby. He thought it was definitely wrong because they might die. But Aruna meant that it wouldn't happen if they didn't let them drink it. It would make them upset and at risk of getting sick and dying faster. Aruna's family doesn't have horses, so they can only drink hot water medicine like her sister, and it's always unfortunate for both of them to suddenly argue with each other. Their grandmother came there and asked if they both agreed, but instead she asked if they were fighting. If both of them could help and leave the alcohol conversation for after the meal, the grandmother assured Dias that they found a coffin of wine in the storage room and thought it would be a good opportunity for dog lovers or anyone who came so everyone could drink it and have a long chat with it, questioning if this is what happened to Aruna's proposal. Dias proposed but talked about the topic that if a dog is a human, the amount of alcohol he can drink for himself will decrease, and it might make him panic and confuse him if he is a heavy drinker at that time telling him not to drink is impossible. At that time, he doesn't want to listen. He thinks about Aruna's true identity that he can't hide with many cultural differences noted and disgusted. He is sure that he is always wrong. A new species comes to the new Eluk village. Culture will be introduced, and when it happens, the village must create new original rules. Or think about it carefully, In is a thief who is God and has self-awareness, so he must protect his property village no matter what enemies they face. The day after the fun party ends, there is a strange white liquid served at breakfast. Aruna reveals that it is the kumis in her mind. After our conversation about alcohol last night, so she went to the village early in the morning, and they gave her some to question whether drinking alcohol is the first thing they do in the morning, Aruna asked him to try a sip. He doubted that it was real alcohol or not. The grandmother asserts that they will need a lot of it to get drunk, taking a sip and thinking it's very weak alcohol. If it's only candy acceptable to give the baby a sip or two, stating that just drinking candy is enough to strengthen their bones and improve their bowel movements. And furthermore, it would be effective in purifying diseases and understanding it for Aruna. Candies are alcohol. That's why she says alcohol is good for the body. When Dias thinks of alcohol, he interprets it as grape wine. After the candy incident, he feels they need to talk about it again, so he looks for time to discuss their habits in the past and now. It appears that the atmosphere is being transmitted to everyone in the village before realizing it. His conversation with everyone naturally increased. One day, Sinai and Ihan approached him and told him that they have gathered many today. Dias praised both of the girls and thanked them, saying they also wanted to build a farm, which will be their own field. Dias agrees and tells them that they will build another small field next time. After everyone returned to their respective places, suddenly Grandma Celia approached Dias. She wanted to talk to him and said there was something on her mind. That night, they all gathered in the meeting room to discuss his proposal. He was happy to hear everyone's opinions, but he said he didn't think it would work. It's all good for now, but when they become 100 or 1,000 people, they won't be able to defend themselves. Doing the same thing as he thought would also be a problem. Everyone agreed with him without thinking deeply. It's like not speaking their minds. Their opinions should be considered in times when they might disagree, or it could lead to fights. He suggested they choose a representative. For example, a group of people would decide who would represent them. Grandma Maya could be the one to represent them. If she represents them, the number of people he has to listen to will be minimized because the representative is responsible for their position. Everyone should speak up, and everyone listening should agree. They discussed what they should do, especially as a result of their positions. The meeting representative is Dias, who will make all decisions and be responsible for them. Aruna expressed her opinion as the one who takes care of her family, who will express her opinion as a village warrior responsible for the military and defense, and Grandma Maya, 
who expressed her opinion on behalf of the human population. Aimer is knowledgeable too, but when they asked him to be Juan's representative, he refused, saying he's still a newcomer. If needed, they should increase the representation they have to decide according to the rules. The people should choose a representative. When they arrived and so on, the meeting that lasted until late at night finally ended with mentioning the decision in the morning. Aruna woke up Dia saying there were visitors. Aruna was sleeping, so she was late to notice. She said they had come very close to the village and assured him that she would inform him when they were on the move. Dias doubted it. There might be some dogs there, but indeed there was only one clear figure, a large one. There were some smaller ones. Dias assumed that the small ones were village dogs, and the large one could be camelots. Aruna said it was something they brought with them, as she saw it when the mask approached, observing that it was a large herd of dogs and giant snakes. But that's why they all ran away.